Luna. It's so good to Shout see you. It is great to be seen and not viewed, as they say. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Are you all set on your end? We're going to um, get ready to start if you're ready. I am ready. Everything good, everyone? Yes, Madam Clerk. Yes, Carrie. You're ready. All right, here we go. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Present. Councilor Braden. Present. Councilor Campbell. Councilor Edwards. Present. Councilor Sabi George. Present. Councilor Flaherty. Yeah. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Janey. Present. Councilor Mejia. Present. Councilor O'Malley. Present. Councilor Wu. Madam President, we do have a quorum. Present. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I am here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to let uh, folks know that um, for the safety of the general public, that this meeting and next week's meeting will be held virtually. We are online now and folks uh, can watch our council meetings live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Um, at this time, I would love to uh, bring up Councillor Flynn uh, and have him introduce our clergy. Uh, we have someone amazing with us today who will open us up and Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I'm honored today to ask Reverend Dr. J. Williams to give the invocation at today's Boston City Council meeting. Reverend Dr. Williams is the lead pastor at Union Church in the South End. And Madam President, you know it very well because we, we both do a lot of work there and it's in the middle of our, of our district as well. Um, it's an outstanding church and it's an outstanding neighbor for so many. The Union Church has a 200 year history and is committed to love, social justice and services and is an LGBTQ affirming church. Reverend Jay is also a strong advocate for social and economic justice. And he has worked closely with many of my colleagues here in the Boston City Council and in the mayor's office. Reverend Dr. Williams holds a master degree with highest honors from the Union Theological Seminary in New York City, a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard College and a PhD in the study of religion from Harvard University Graduate School. He is also an instructor at the Boston University School of Theology. It is great to have him here today to give this invoc invocation. And I'm going to ask uh, Reverend, Reverend Jay Williams if, if he'd like to give the prayer uh, but before I do that, um, Madam President, I know you also are friendly uh, with Reverend Dr. Jay Williams. I don't know if you'd like to, um, you know, introduce him as well. Thank you so much. I'm not sure there's much to add uh, for our esteemed guest. I just want to extend my deep gratitude to you, uh, Reverend Jay, for all you do. Uh, you've been a good friend to this body and a good friend to our city. Thank you for all you do. Uh, and thank you. Uh, Councilor Flynn, this is a great choice to open us up today. Reverend Jay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council and Boston. Indeed, I'm Jay Williams. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the lead pastor of Union Church in the South End, and we are a faith community committed to unconditional love, compassionate service, intersectional justice, and the gospel of liberation with deepest gratitude to Councilor Flynn for the invitation uh, to our council president, President Janey, our, our soon to be acting mayor and to this truly diverse and historic city council. As we continue to make history, I greet you in the name of all that is holy, 
in the name of all that compels us in the pursuit of justice, Indeed, in the name of all that ignites us with righteous anger and divine discontent for injustice and inequity. So let us pray. Take a deep breath. We can breathe again. We have a fresh start, a new beginning, a new lease on the collective life of the civic commonwealth and thank God, a new administration in Washington, DC. Yes, today is a new day. Today is day one and what a difference a day makes. Take a deep breath and breathe in the fresh air, the air that is lighter, a bit sweeter. There's something in the air that smells like delight. It is fresh and full of potential and possibility. As we pray, I invite you to take a breath prayer and take a deep breath and inhale the goodness of this grand moment, the moment we have fought for and organized for and prayed for, the moment we have been given to breathe again and begin again and to complete the work to bring into its fullness the prospects we bear. Our 22-year-old National Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman, as she describes herself, that skinny Black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother, that beautiful Black queen whose glory radiated with red crown and golden cloak, she is correct. Her words are our prayer. Somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We will finish. And we will take a deep breath and exhale the pain of this past year and its dual pandemics of coronavirus and of anti-Black racism, which collectively have been nothing short of suffocating. And the vicious murder of George Floyd in the age of coronavirus has drawn awareness to what's been described as COVID-1619 and has trained the eyes of our nation, our city, on the gaze of the sin of white supremacy, which has killed black bodies since our stolen arrival from Africa to these American shores, which were stolen from slaughtered indigenous people 400 years ago in 1619. So beloved, today is a new day to right these world historical wrongs. So take a deep breath, you count. So we have work to do. And as we breathe deeply, the life-giving spirit of Holy One, let the fresh wind of goodness inspire you to do the work of ensuring that diversity and inclusion are more than just buzzwords. Take a deep breath to be inspired by the Holy One to close the wealth gap in Boston, ensuring that all have equitable living wages and all might participate indeed in the common wealth. Bless this council, O God, to do this work and the work set before them on this day. Bless them to be blessings. In the name of the one who loves us into freedom known by many names, experienced in many ways. In the name of all that is holy, we pray. Let it be so, ashe and amen. Amen, amen, amen. I hope you will join us. Um, I know you're so busy, um, like so many of us, because the work is unfinished and we have to continue this work. Um, but at this time, we will pledge allegiance to our flag um, I hope you will join us for this and feel free to then excuse yourself at your discretion. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again, Reverend Jay, for that 
inspiring and on-time message and prayer for us. Um, before we move on, Madam Clerk, would you please amend the attendance report? I just saw Councillor Arroyo, and I see that Councillor Campbell has joined us as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now move on to the first order of business, which is the approval of our minutes, seeing and hearing no discussion on this matter. The chair moves that the minutes from the last meeting uh, stand as presented. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Councilor yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Council Mejia. Council O'Malley. Yes. Council O'Malley, yes. Council Wu. Sorry, Council I've been having trouble with the mute button. Yes, yes. <laughs> Council Wu, yes. Madam President, the uh, minutes have been approved. Thank you so much. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. And now we'll move on to communications from His Honor the Mayor. Uh, beginning with docket 0191, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Docket 0191, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $13,520,000 in the form of a grant for the federal FY20 Urban Area Security Initiative, awarded by the United States Department of Homeland Security, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, be administered by the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management. The grant will fund continued support for planning, exercises, training, and operations that build regional capacity to help prevent, respond, and recover from threats or acts of terrorism, including chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive incidents. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Uh, docket 0191 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. We'll move on to Docket 0192. Thank you. Docket 0192, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $691,110 in the form of a grant for the COVID-19 response grant awarded by the City for... <clears throat> excuse me, by the city for tech and civic life to be administered by the election department. The grant funded planning and operating a safe and secure election administration in the city of Boston for the 2020 election. Thank you so much. Docket 0192 will be referred to the Committee on Public mm -hmm. Health. Can you please read Docket 0193? Docket 0193, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $370,457 in the form of a grant for the FY20 Burn Justice Assistance Grant local allocation, awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund a domestic violence management analyst at the Family Justice Center a hub and core coordinator and a technical coordinator for multiple data collecting, reporting and record management systems. Thank you so much. Docket 0193 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Can you please read Docket 0194? Thank you. Docket 0194, message and order approving the appropriation of $306,000 for the purpose of paying costs of a feasibility study and schematic design work associated with the boiler windows replacement project at the following schools, Samuel Adams Elementary School and the Patrick J. Kennedy School Elementary School, for which the city of Boston may be eligible for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority and set amount to be expended under the direction of the Public Facilities Department on behalf of the Boston Public Schools. 
Thank you so much, Docket 0194 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. I see um, a hand. The chair recognizes uh, Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards. I wanna to apologize to uh, Madam President. I should have um, proposed this earlier. This, this is for schools in my district who, um, and some of them have windows that specifically can't be retrofitted to allow for fans for COVID. And this is $306 that also, it also goes to a feasibility study to help make sure that they're retrofitted and for their boilers. And so again, I apologize for this late, I should, uh, late um, request, but I'm hoping that we could possibly put this before the body, allowing them to get this money from the state, and make them eligible for the state and also um, suspend and pass for $306 for this school. So this is going to, thank you for um, you bringing up how urgent this is and how you want this to move, but this is a matter for the Committee on Ways and Means. And so I, I don't know if Councilor Bach would like to speak to this. I'm, I'm gonna leave it in her committee uh, and hope that she will have a quick hearing unless she wants to speak and move to suspend and pass now. Um, not, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sorry, I uh, obviously catching me slightly off guard. Um, uh, in general, with these MSBA grants, obviously it's something that we've been very uh, enthusiastic about the city being able to get so much money from the state on. Um, and we do traditionally have a hearing. Um, so uh, I understand. Yeah, I, I just, I That's think, fun. I think it's something that I, I mean, I certainly Councillor Edwards would, would be happy to schedule a hearing very expeditiously, oh, yeah. but it's something Thank we you. can move quickly, but I think it's better not yeah. to break that precedent. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Councillor Bach. And you have that already. I've assigned it to the committee, Madam Clerk. Yes. yes, thank you, Madam President. Yes. Thank you so much. And I appreciate um, you have flagging the urgency there and the time sensitivity there, Councillor Edwards. We'll move on now to docket 0195. Madam President, would you like me to read all three. Yes, I would like you to read, I'm so sorry, docket 0195, docket 0196, and 0197 together. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Docket 0195, Estrogen Order authorizes the City of Boston to accept and expand an amount of $113,359 in the form of a grant for the federal FY20 Violence Against Women Act Stop Grant awarded by the United States Department of Justice, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the police department. The grant will fund a civilian violence advocate who provides services for victims in Jamaica Plain and East Boston and over time for all domestic violence advocates. Docket 0196, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend an amount of $9,000 in the form of a grant for the federal FY20 Violence Against Women Act STOP grant awarded by the United States Department of Justice passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the police department. The grant will fund overtime for civilian domestic violence advocates. And docket number 0197, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept an expanded amount of $8,900 in the form of a grant, a charitable donation awarded by Imago Dea Fund to be administered by the police department. The grant will fund to launch a webinar series focused on commercial sexual, sexual exploitation in Greater Boston. Thank you so much. At this time, the chair recognizes Councillor Campbell, who is chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Councillor Campbell, um, you have uh, Thank you very much, Madam President, and thank you, Madam Clerk, for reading all three. Um, I'm asking as chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice that we suspend and suspend the rules and pass all three grants today. The first, uh, docket 0195, uh, is a grant we've received in the past. We've actually constantly been pushing for more resources uh, to address issues of domestic violence. This will actually go to fund um, uh, violence uh, advocates who provide services for victims, specifically, or I should say survivors, specifically in Jamaica Plain, East Boston, in East Boston. Um, so asking that we suspend and pass uh, that grant. 
The next is docket 0196, which is a relatively small amount. Um, also uh, for similar purposes, it would be used to fund the work of our domestic violence advocates. And obviously these resources are incredibly precious and extremely important in this moment in time. So asking that we suspend the rules and pass docket 0196. And then lastly, docket 0197, which is also relatively small, uh, is pretty specific and would be used uh, to fund a webinar series that will focus on commercial, ex uh, commercial sexual exploitation in greater Boston. Critically important, uh, the department frankly is always seeking more, resource, real, more resources for these efforts. So as chair asking that, uh, that we suspend the rules and pass docket 0197. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. And we're gonna vote on each of these dockets separately. And we'll start with docket 0195. Uh, Councilor Campbell seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0195. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Councilor Asabi George. I'm mute. Muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor yes. O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, Docket 0195 has received a unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Docket 0195 has passed and we'll move on to Docket 0196. In this case, again, Councilor Campbell seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0196. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Certainly. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0196 has received a unanimous. Thank you so much. Docket 0196 has passed. And for the last docket, Councilor Campbell seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0197. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Docket 0197, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0197 has received a unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Docket 0197 has passed. I see Councilor Flaherty has his uh, blue hand up. Councilor Flaherty, you have a question or comment? Yes, yeah. thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam President. And through you, obviously, maybe to the clerk, is the next eight items are communications from Ms. Honor the Mayor. I noticed that there's no addresses of the applicants listed. That's uh, normally pro forma so that we can ascertain as to whether or not they live in the city or not. So 
just want to make sure no one's being cute and um, trying to slide someone in that's not from the city. So not sure what that process is, but through you to the clerk, if we could ascertain and maybe it, maybe the something might be for Fernando Ortiz to uh, run off the ground ball and get the addresses for the next eight applicants that were being asked to obviously to to uh, to review their confirmation and reappointment and or appointment. And if I may, Madam President, respond. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Council of Flaherty, uh, in the reports of communication from the mayor, addresses are never given on that. I can tell you that not every board and commission has residency, although a lot of them do. Um, and when we receive, um, you know, as we, as you know, that the clerk's office um, actually swears all these people in, uh, but I know that they are filed in the letter that the mayor sends. So I, it's very easy for us to get those addresses for you. Thank you, but Mayor. They are Thank not you, historically Clark. ever, ever presented in the agenda. Very good. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam President. Just want to make sure that Boston residents are being afforded the best opportunity to potentially get uh, to stay involved and to be appointed to various positions. Right. I appreciate your advocacy. Thank you so much, Councilor Flaherty. Madam Clerk, um, could you please read the next two dockets together? This is uh, docket 0198 and 0199. Sure. Docket 0198, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of John Fernandez as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 6, 2024. And docket number 0199, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment, excuse me, of Dr. Jennifer Giles Rorschach as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 6, 2024. Thank you so much. Docket 0198 and 0199 will be referred to the Committee on Public Health. And Madam Clerk, if you could please read docket 0200 through 0204 together, that would be great. Thank you. And, and I just, as, as a add, in the packet, the addresses are on the letters that the MIA sends. Yes, they are. Thank you. They're just not posted on the agenda. Um, docket number 0200, message and order for the confirmation of the appointment of Ian Renahan as an alternate member of the Boston Landmarks Commission for a term expiring on January 30th, 2022. Docket number 0201, message and order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Alice Richmond as an alter alternate member of the Beacon Hill Architectural Commission for term expiring on May 1st, 2025. Docket number 0202, message and order for the confirmation of the, of the appointment of Matthew Blumenthal as a member of the Beacon Hill Architectural Commission for term expiring on May 1st, 2021. Docket number 0203, message and order for the confirmation of the appointment of Robert Weintraub as a member of the Back Bay Architectural Commission for term expiring on December 31st, 2024. And docket number 0204, message and order for the confirmation of the appointment of Elisa Drayton to the board of directors for the Boston Industrial Development Finance Authority for term expiring April 1st, 2025. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Dockets 0200 through 0204 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. If you could please read docket 02. 05, that would be great. Thank you. Docket 0205, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Thomas Keedy as a member of the Boston Water and Sewer Commission for term ending January 7th, 2023. Thank you. Docket 0205 will be referred to the Committee on City and Neighborhood Services. We will uh, now move on to reports of public officers. Um, Madam Clerk, if we could read, if you could read docket 0206 through 0210. Wonderful. Docket 0206, notices the see from the mayor of his absence from the city from 1130 a.m. on Tuesday, January 19th, 
until 9 p.m. on Wednesday, January 20th, 2021. Docket number 0207, notice to CC from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of December 9th, 2020. Docket number 0208, notice is received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of December 16th, 2020. Docket number 0209, notice is received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 regarding action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of January 13th, 2021. Docket number 0210, communication was received from the city clerk of the filing of the <clears throat> excuse me, of the Boston Planning and Development Agency on the 10th Amendment to the Report and Decision on the Landmark Center Chapter 121A Project. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Uh, docket 0206 through 0210 will be placed on file. We will now move on to reports of committees. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please read Docket 0114 and 0115 together. Thank you. Docket 0114, the Committee on Ways and Means to which is referred on January 13th, 2021, docket number 0114. Message and order approving a supplemental appropriation of $1,857,220 for the Boston Public Schools to the FY21 cover the cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston School Committee and the Boston Association of of school administrators and supervisors, known as BASIS, submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. And docket number 0115, the Committee on Ways and Means to which was referred on January 13th, 2021, docket number 0115, message in order to reduce the appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $1,857,220 to provide funding for the FY21 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Boston School Committee and the Boston Association of School Administrators and Supervisors, known as BASIS, submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. At this time, the chair recognizes Councillor Bach, who is the chair of the Committee of Ways and Means. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, um, Councillors Asabi George, Flynn, Flaherty, and Braden, um, who joined us for this hearing last week um, on uh, the Boston Association of School Administrators and Supervisors contract. Um, so as folks know, uh, the many collective bargaining units of the city, um, they negotiate new contracts with the Office of Labor Relations in the city administration or with the um, Labor Relations Office within BPS, um, as is in this case. And then uh, when they reach an agreement uh, and it's signed on the administration side and then um, voted ratified by the members of the unit, it comes before us for consideration at the council. Um, and that last step is in ways and means because we have to vote to fund the contract. So this is the um, situation that we're in vis-a-vis -vis basis. Uh, we had a really great um, presentation uh, from Mr. Jeremiah Hassan. Um, for, at BPS Labor Relations. Um, this is a contract that frankly has been out for a long time. Um, so it's actually entirely retroactive. Um, there uh, was no agreement between 2016 and uh, August, 2020 when the contract, um, when the now agreement sort of finishes. Um, and, uh, and so because of that, um, the folks who are members of our school administrators and supervisors unit um, have gone those four years without any raises or cost of living increases um, like what other uh, folks in the city have seen. And this is one of the last um, contracts from the sort of round of 2016 to 2020 um, that's still outstanding. So, you know, I think the parties had been at a bit of an impasse. Uh, and then what we really heard um, was that, especially in the COVID situation, and frankly with, you know, our school administrators and supervisors just doing an, an enormous amount to help um, to help our school communities navigate through this crisis, um, really, you know, throwing themselves into the work in all kinds of different ways and, um, 
and, and actually a number of them really leading the food distribution efforts, you know, there was a strong feeling like this didn't, this needed to not hang out anymore. So I think the parties um, reached an agreement uh, that's commensurate with what had been reached with other units. So it's over those four years, a 2% um, pay increase for each of those four years. Um, and, uh, and then on the contract provision side, um, there was a agreement to, um, to shift an aspect of the contract provision so that if one of our school leaders, one of our principals, creates a new leadership position on their leadership team, they have the opportunity to have an open hiring process for that and that there isn't a right to recall that just automatically fills that with somebody. Um, and I think the school department felt it was important for our school principals to have that kind of um, autonomy as they think about setting up the best possible leadership for their uh, school community and team. Um, and so that was the agreement reached. Um, we, uh, we heard from uh, Dominic, the head of basis, just about um, you know, the appreciation for the fact that agreement has been reached and the fact that there's been a really long wait um, for these raises. And obviously in a time of a lot of uh, financial pressure, it's something that um, means a lot to his members. Uh, and the BPS had put aside a um, contract bargaining reserve in relation to this contract that's funding it about $3 million worth of what um, of the retroactive raises but what, what's before us today is to fund those raises in FY21, this fiscal year. Um, so it's, it's sort of the balance. It's, a, it's another, you know, a little less than one and a half million um, to do that. So that's, uh, that's kind of my quick summary. Um, and uh, like I said, it was a good hearing. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, these folks are really important city workers, school workers. Um, they're critical to both our central leadership teams and our school-based leadership teams. Um, and uh, and I, I think it's incumbent upon us as a council to fund this contract. So um, that's my recommendation today is that uh, we ought to pass both these dockets. So one is to sort of um, take the money out of the central collective bargaining reserve and allocate it as an appropriation to cover those FY21 um, costs. Uh, this, um, this, like I said, puts basis kind of at the same place as most of our collective bargaining units in the city, which is that they're almost all, um, they almost all have lapsed contracts and are up for negotiation, um, which the pandemic has complicated. Uh, and so basis will be in the same boat, but at least it will not be that four years back that it has been. Um, so I think uh, it's important to vote on this today and I, I would urge an affirmative vote for passage. Thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you so much. We will vote on these separately um, and we will start with the first docket. Councilor Box seeks, seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0114. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll on that? Certainly. Count docket 0114, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Oh Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0114 has received a unanimous vote. Docket. Okay, go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay, go ahead. <laughs> docket number 0115, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0115 has received a unanimous vote. 
Thank you so much. Um, the committee reports have been accepted and both dockets 0114 and 0115 have been passed. We will now move on to matters recently heard for possible action. Um, Madam Clerk, could you please read docket 0155? Thank you. Docket 0155, petition for a special law regarding an act relative to the office of mayor in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Edwards, who is chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, yesterday, we had a robust conversation on the proposal of Docket 0155, an act relative to the office of mayor in, <clears throat> in the city of Boston. Councillor Arroyo is the lead sponsor on this matter, in which uh, the uh, home rule petition uh, seeks to um, seeks to essentially cancel the special election in 2021. Um, and, and, and allowing, excuse me, Madam President, if I may take, um, sorry. And allowing the, um, Madam President, if you could come back to me. Yes, we can, uh, we're gonna take a brief recess, Madam Clerk. Yes, I'm gonna zoom, I'm in my job. What happened? Councilman Mejia, you're not on mute. Okay, thank you. Hello, we're gonna come back. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Can everyone hear me? Thank you yes. so much. Yes. Uh, Madam Clerk, I'm gonna propose that we um, reorder the agenda and come back to matters recently heard for possible Thank action, you. which is only one docket. We will come back to that docket after we go through motions, orders, and resolutions. Thank you. Okay. So at this time, Madam Clerk, I will ask you to please read Docket 0211 into the record. Thank you. Thank you Doc so much. My pleasure. Docket 0211, Councils Arroyo and Wu offer the following order for hearing regarding BPS exam school admission policy and its impact on diverse enrollment. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. And I was not prepared for that. Um, <laughs> The chair recognizes uh, Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to add uh, Julia Mejia to this as a co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, uh, Councillor Mejia has been added as an original co-sponsor. This is a refile from last session, so I'll just make it very brief. Um, it's looking to evaluate how the Boston Public Schools exam, exam school admissions policy has impacted diversity at exam schools, as many know, 
Uh, we, we created a different system for COVID for this year. Um, it was meant to expire uh, by, this, uh, by the outgoing mayor, uh, I believe for next school year, but we are still in a similar situation. And I think it's worth looking at and formulating admission policies going forward in a more uh, permanent way uh, and realizing uh, or rather analyzing how this change this year has impacted uh, diversity at the exam schools. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and thank you to the lead sponsor for his leadership and partnership. Um, as mentioned, the policies that were approved by the school committee um, were uh, in a moment of crisis an equitable, thoughtful alternative. Um, it was also a, a, a big change for many families that deserves more advanced conversation and the opportunity for process and full inclusion and participation in that process. So looking forward to talking about the long term for the district and the best way to keep our goals of closing gaps and ensuring equitable access in every one of our schools and pathways uh, going over, not just the um, survival and um, putting health and, and well-being first during the pandemic, but to, to keep truly closing gaps over the long run in BPS. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. At this time, the chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the chairs and my co-sponsors, Councilors Arroyo and Wu. This docket is a refile. Um, we started this conversation last year, given the exam suspension in light of the pandemic. We need to continue this conversation beyond the pandemic, and I hope that this hearing will achieve just that. I mean, we look forward to having this conversation, and I would like to thank my co-sponsors, and I also would like to note that, you know, when it comes to issues of education, I understand that, um, that we need to really be thoughtful about making sure that we're looking at these discussions through a civil rights lens as well, because a lot of these issues are really infringing on the rights of our students being able to have access to quality um, and equitable education across all schools. You're on mute, my love. You're still on mute, or am I on mute? Thank you. I th <laughs> Thank you. I thought you were telling Councillor Sabi George she was on mute. The chair recognizes Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'm pleased that the makers are continuing to raise this issue and have this uh, discussion. We certainly need an opportunity to review the policy changes from this last school year, or this current school year and to ensure a smooth process for our families seeking a seat at an exam school. I look forward to chairing this hearing and being part of the continued conversation and ensuring that the work done is done well. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Not seeing any other speakers, uh, would folks like to sign on? Add their names, show a physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Flynn, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Arroyo, who's a maker here, <laughs> Councillor Bach, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Mejia, you're already on it, Councillor Braden, Councillor Flaherty, any other, did I miss anyone? Please also add the chair, as folks know, this is an important issue to me as well. I'm looking forward to having a good conversation. Uh, we will now move on to docket 0212, Madam Clerk. Docket 0212, Councilors Bach and O'Malley offered the following order for hearing regarding zone relief for 100% affordable and deeply affordable housing projects. Great. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. I mean, this is also a refile, so I'll be brief. Uh, last year, Councilor O'Malley and I held a hearing um, where we heard from both the mayor's administration and advocates. Um, and Importantly, also got presentations from elected officials in Cambridge and Somerville about their municipalities recently passed affordable housing zoning overlays. Um, as folks will remember, you know, this was uh, prompted both by the kind of systematic policy challenge of citing deeply affordable and 100% affordable projects, um, and by specifically an effort to um, block such a project, a really very much needed supportive housing project um, proposed by the Pine Street Inn and the community builders in Councilor O'Malley's district. Um, and 
now, you know, both Somerville and Cambridge serve as great examples to us of this type of zoning relief and Somerville's just passed back in December. Um, and so we're really excited to get to work on language for a zoning amendment um, that'll enable Boston similarly to, uh, to build deeply affordable housing with less delays and a more streamlined zoning process. We're still making sure that we're taking care of um, you know, the important steps along the way in zoning. Um, the reality is that our Boston zoning code is very different from the Somerville and Cambridge ones. Um, so it's not a case where we can kind of copy paste. It's got to be drafted for Boston, um, but we're looking forward to doing that work and uh, it'll be coming in the months ahead. So grateful to Councillor O'Malley for his partnership and excited to work on this. Thank you so much, Councillor Black. The chair recognizes Councillor O'Malley. Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, just very briefly, because we have a jam-packed agenda today. Thank you, of course, to the my uh, co-sponsor and colleague, Councillor Bach, for her leadership in this. Uh, since this has last been filed, we've seen 6,500 uh, evictions that have been filed in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, I wouldn't say a majority in Suffolk County, but certainly a plurality or, or among the among the top uh, counties that have seen that. Um, as we are still very much in the midst of a pandemic, so needless to say, the need for affordable housing has never been greater. Um, this is particularly relevant as it relates to my district. As has been mentioned, there was a project that was as supported and as universally supported a project as I have encountered in 10 years. A large scale part project that is, um, is being held up through some, in my opinion, frivolous litigation from a uh, butter who owns a building but does not, of course, live in the neighborhood, uh, does not live in the city, um, who's brought suit to slow something down, um, thus denying hundreds of, of individuals a safe, clean place to live. Um, this is in the heart of Washington Street and Jamaica Plain. It's also in the heart of the Plan JP Rocks uh, corridor study, something that I've been advocating for um, nearly my entire time on this body. And as we recently as last week, there was another meeting where this, of course, came up. So looking forward to quick action and uh, thank uh, my colleague for her partnership and all of you for your uh, support uh, in uh, the first time this was filed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley. And before we move on, I just want to make sure that the last docket, I know Councillor Savi George said she looks forward to chairing it. Let me put it in her committee so that she can chair it. So uh, before we continue on with docket 0212, want to make clear that docket 0211 which was the docket offered by Councillors Arroyo, Wu, and Mejia, that is being referred to the Committee on Education. Okay, and now we are still talking about docket 0212, sponsored by Councillor Bach and Councillor Malley. Very important docket. I will now call upon Councillor Sabi George, who would, you would like to speak to this? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you, Madam President. I am in full support of pursuing some measures to provide zoning relief to 100% affordable housing developments. I'd like to make sure though, through this conversation, we're also considering how we can encourage more affordable family-sized housing in these um, developments as well. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you to the mayor. Thank you. Not seeing any other speakers. Show of physical hands. Wonderful. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Flynn, Councillor Braden, Councillor Wu, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Arroyo, please also add the chair. Did I get everyone? Me Councilor too. Campbell. Thanks, Madam President. Yes, yeah. Councillor Campbell. I think I have everyone. Please also add the chair. Docket 0212 will be assigned refer to the Committee on Planning Development and Transportation. We'll move on to docket 0213. Docket 0213, Councilors Bach and Campbell offer the following order for hearing regarding Boston Police Overtime. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, this is again a refile. Uh, as folks know, we made a commitment to track the overtime uh, cut to the Boston Police Department budget all through the year and really make sure that we're actually achieving it. And what we saw in the first two hearings that we had on this in July and then November um, was that uh, although there have been some significant savings, um, they're largely uh, due to COVID um, related aspects and uh, and I don't think we have yet seen the kind of systematic plan from the department um, that would uh, both get realize the full gains that are expected in terms of the budget and um, and kind of make them stick and make them permanent. So this is something that 
we're going to continue to track um, and continue to chase. And so refiling this so that we can have another one of these quarterly hearings coming up soon. I think it's really important as we go into another budget season um, where this is going to continue to be a major issue um, that the council's apprised of um, where we stand and that we're putting maximum pressure uh, on, on the department um, to really make like meaningful, serious overtime control reforms, um, which is which is different from sort of passively watching the ticker. So thank you, Madam President, and thank you to my co-sponsors uh, on this matter. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Campbell. Councilor Campbell, you have the floor. And uh, thank you, Madam President. I too want to thank my uh, co-sponsors, uh, Councilor Bach and Councilor O'Malley on this. Um, and and Councilor Bach summed it up well. You know, we need a, a plan and a thoughtful one while recognizing, of course, the challenges of the department um, so that everyone, particularly those in the public, are crystal clear on how we're going to realize uh, those savings. And so looking forward to continued discussions with the administration and, of course, the department. Thank you, Madam President. And you two original co-sponsors are seeking suspension of the rules to add a third co-sponsor, yes? We are, Madam oh, yes. <laughs> I am so sorry. Yes, yes. we have no objections. <laughs> Council O'Malley has been added as an original co-sponsor. <laughs> and Council O'Malley, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you again to uh, Councillors Campbell and Bach uh, for their leadership and partnership on this. Um, very briefly, what gets measured gets managed. That's a mantra that we as fiscal stewards in the city of Boston should always maintain. Uh, having a uh, oversight as is part of our job uh, is important. Uh, and as we reflect on the budget, as we spend the budget, as we shape the next year budget, and the only other thing that I would add to this is something I brought up in our uh, working session and will continue to do so, is the notion of a shift length experiment, which many other cities have done, uh, has been a proven way to help rein in overtime costs. And it's something that I hope we continue to not only explore, but adopt here in the city. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Not seeing any other speakers, a show of physical hands for folks who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Wu, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Edwards, please add uh, Mike, uh, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Royo, Councillor Mejia, please also add the chair. Did I get everyone? Please also add Councillor Flynn. Docket 0213 will be referred to the Committee of Ways and Means. Madam Clerk, if you could please read uh, Docket 0214. Docket 0214, Council of Braden offered the following order for hearing regarding the Austin Brighton Master Plan and Zoning Initiative. Thank you so much. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam President. I'm really pleased to file uh, and initiate an effort to establish a district-wide Austin Brighton Master Plan and Zoning Initiative. Um, it's incredible to know that uh, Austin Brighton has never had a, a comprehensive district-wide master plan. The critical issues that drive the need for such uh, a master plan are um, that are issues that have impacted our neighborhood over the past 10 years. Uh, we have expansion of our academic and medical institutions. Uh, there's a great need for housing affordability and ho more homeownership opportunities. We need to preserve and expand our existing green space and protect our urban wilds. Uh, public transit infrastructure uh, is not uh, being expanded or improved to meet the increased demand from a, a large number of transit oriented uh, developments in the neighborhood. Um, and climate resiliency measures need to be addressed as, as, uh, as many of us know, we have an increased uh, incidence of heavy precipitation and heat waves, and we need to ha uh, have measures to manage stormwater and reduce the he urban heat island effect. Over the past 10 years, Austin Brighton uh, has developed or has seen the development of 13 million square feet of new construction that has been approved by the BPDA for in the neighborhood. Uh, and in, in alignment with the uh, city's goals to create 53,000 new housing units by 2030, Alston Brighton has seen uh, the development of 7,000 new housing units which are in the, the completed or in the pipeline. And it's, however, the residential projects approved by the BPDA and Alston Brighton over the past 10 years 
have seen that the average income restricted units are barely above the minimum at 14%. And there is insufficient, and, and there in, the number of affordable housing units are insufficient to meet the needs of Alston Brighton and the citywide residents who need affordable housing. Very pertinent in, in, in light of recent uh, discussion of the previous two hearing orders. The on, only 20% of the market rate units produced have been home ownership units. And family sized units are largely uh, excluded from all of the new, new uh, residential development projects in Alston Brighton. The units improve, approved in the neighborhood since 2011, roughly 66% are either one bedrooms or studios or single occupancy units, with roughly only 3% of the units are three bedrooms, which is, uh, is uh, in, unacceptable when, as we try and house our, our uh, families, to, to Councillor Asabi George's point earlier. The market rate new build residential units are unaffordable to the majority of our residents in Alston Brighton, most of whom earn close to 50 to 60% of the area median income. And while we need proactive and equity minded planning for, uh, informed by uh, the lived realities and needs of community residents, the current practices encourage variance driven spot uh, zoning and allow development and market priorities to the dictate neighborhood planning, rather than starting with a comprehensive plan crafted and initiated by, uh, with, by a vision for the driven by community residents. So it's with great, um, great excitement that I propose a hearing that will serve as uh, to kickstart and initiate a planning initiative with, to um, and develop a district-wide master plan for Alston Brighton that is community driven and informed by civic leaders, city planners, the public, young professionals, working families, our students and artists in Alston Brighton. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Just like to, just like to have my name added. I know uh, our district colleague has been doing great work over there, keeping an eye on all that's happening, uh, particularly in the development front. So. We've been working closely together on a number of things. So she has my support in calling for the rezoning. It hasn't been done in a while. Last time, I believe it or not, last time it was done, I was actually here. So I could add tremendous value, I think, um, to, to our district colleague as they start to go through that process. But please sign my name and I'm happy to help any way that I can. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I similarly wanted to ask that my name be added and to thank our colleague for her leadership on this. It makes such a big difference when our, our body stands up and, and calls for thoughtful, community-driven, equitable development and planning. We've seen Councillor Edwards take on that issue and make a huge difference all throughout her district and in various parts throughout the city. This has uh, really been pushed forward when the council speaks up. And so I just want to make an extra note. You know, Councillor Braden gave, a, a, of course, fantastic, eloquent summary of everything. For me, it's just such a striking figure that Along Western Ave alone, $40 billion of development is already being planned. And so there needs to be a, a neighborhood wide plan that fits that together with the needs of our residents. Um, I wanna give a special shout out and um, mention to the artist community in this area who are seeing not just longtime residents, important stakeholders and contributors to the economy feeling the stress of displacement and gentrification uh, but important music venues that are much more than just economic drivers, but community hubs also being threatened in this process. So um, in this neighborhood in particular and throughout the city, we need thoughtful planning. And I'm really eager to support Councilor Braden in her push uh, for also Brighton. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. A show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name. Great, Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Flynn, Councillor Wu, Councillor Arroyo, you already have Councillor Flaherty, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Bach. Did I get everyone? Please also add the chair. Docket 0214 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. We'll move on to Docket 0215. Docket 0215, Councillor Mejia authored the following order for hearing discussing commercial vacancies in Boston. 
Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam President. I will try to keep my remarks brief um, as this is not a refile. So don't hold that timer to me, okay? I hope to take a little bit of time to explain why I'm filing this. Um, this isn't exactly one of the, those glamorous or high profile conversations, but it's one that we need to have as soon as possible. We have spoken with me so many times about the hurdles that are in place for people looking to start businesses. And as the chair of, of the Committee of Small Business and Workforce Development, it is our job to remove those barriers and make it easier for people to start their own businesses. The cost of obtaining a brick and mortar storefront is a hurdle that not a lot of people are able to afford, particularly in black and brown communities where access to capital is so limited. Before the pandemic, the commercial vacancy rate was somewhere around 2%, which is low. With so few properties available, the ones that, are, that were available cost more than, than most people would be able to afford. During co the COVID-19 pandemic, vacancies skyrocketed. And while this would be normally mean the, while this would normally mean that prices would drop, studies have shown that bank lenders are going to make it harder to get a loan to start a small business. So for, start, for small startups, it is hard to start a business before the pandemic, and it's been hard to start a business during the pandemic. The question is, what are we going to do once the pandemic is over? We have an opportunity to be proactive, not reactive. And when it comes to supporting small businesses in our city, we want everyone to be a part of this conversation so that we can work together to build back our small business community. I look forward to hearing this and I also wanna thank all the amazing advocates who helped us bring this hearing to the table, particularly Darrell um, Weathers who has uh, been with us um, and holding us accountable to this conversation. And I also wanna give a quick shout out to Councillor O'Malley and his team um, who uh, years ago, um, also presented this, and I know there is some reservation in terms of having this conversation in the time of COVID, but we figured if not now, when? So looking forward to the dialogue. Thank you so much. Not seeing any other speakers, a show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Bach, Councillor Edwards, Councillor LaRue, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Arroyo, please also add the chair. Councillor Campbell, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't find my raise hand. Um, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Councilman Mejia, for the hearing order um, and also for, of course, lifting up Council O'Malley as well, because we partnered on this, um, not specifically commercial, I more with the residential uh, vacancies, which is critically important. So looking forward to this conversation, particularly as we think about how we activate commercial and residential spaces for community purposes, critically important to address whether it's the wealth gap, economic opportunities, uh, the housing crisis, and so many other purposes. So thank you so much for bringing it forward. And uh, Madam President, if you could add my name. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You have all. And please add uh, Madam Clerk, Councilor Sabi George, as well as the chair. Docket 0215 will be referred to the Committee on Small Business and Workforce Development. We'll move on to Docket 0216. Thank you. Docket 0216, Council Mejia offered the following ordinance to establish guidelines for permitting residential kitchens. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm really excited about this one. We have an opportunity to completely change the way we do business, literally, in Boston. We have met so many entrepreneurs who are creative, motivated, and dedicated to their community. Their only problem is that they don't have the money that they need to start a business. As the chair of the Committee on Small Businesses, we see it all the time. I know, I know what it's like too. I've worked hard to get multiple nonprofits off the ground. It's tough, so tough that some people quit before they even begin. We need to find ways to make it easier for entrepreneurs to get a leg up in the city. That's why our office has been working with the amazing community activists to find a way to reduce barriers to economic empowerment. What we are proposing is to create a system that allows for a type of business known as quote unquote residential kitchens. A residential kitchen is an, an it is an, oops, a residential kitchen is an, is any kind of food businesses that all sell certain products that were prepared in their homes, kitchens directly to the consumer. 
This is something that the state already, already allows and cities across Massachusetts like Concord, Newton, Arlington have already put this into action. All we have to do is write it into the books. Our ordinance does two things. First, it creates the permitting process for at-home entrepreneurs who are interested in applying for a permit. We have, been we have been working closely with ISD and the Department of Small Business Development to make sure that this process is easy and affordable. Second, this ordinance uh, outlines ways in which the city can ensure that the products and the employees of the retail kitchen follow all um, health code standards. During our hearing on at-home entrepreneurs in October, we learned that 22 businesses, mainly in Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan, are being operated in people's homes without a license. To us, this says that there's clearly, clearly a need to find ways to make it easier for people to build wealth and to do so legally to operate their businesses, particularly in communities of color. I am confident that we have something here that will change the way we do business in the city of Boston. Thank you to all the advocates, especially Irene and Andre, for their hard work in making sure that this ordinance is representative of the needs of the people. We look forward to working with you further. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Sabi George. Councilor Sabi George, you're at the floor. Thank you um, again, Madam President. Thank you to the maker for this ordinance and pursuing a permitting process for residential kitchens and the cottage food industry. Our smallest scale entrepreneurs ought to have a clear process and an understanding of the safety protocols necessary for operating a food business. Our more traditional food enterprises know how hard it is to operate a food business, especially right now during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We should work to ensure that all food businesses have to comply with the same baseline of food safety standards. And I look forward to participating in this conversation, support, supporting all of our local businesses as it will be critical to our city's recovery. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you again to the maker. Thank you. Not seeing any other speakers, a show of physical hands, please, for those who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor Bach, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Royo, Councilor Wu. Did I get everyone? And please also add the chair. Uh, docket 0216 will be referred to the Committee of Government Operations. Madam Clerk, could you please read Docket 0217? Docket 0217, Councilor O'Malley offered the following order regarding a text amendment on the Green Belt Protection Overlay District. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor O'Malley. Councilor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, Article 29 of the Boston Zoning Code allows us to establish a uh, GPOD, which is an acronym for Greenbelt Protection, Protection Overlay District, uh, which will preserve and enhance air quality by protecting supply of green and open space along the city's Greenbelt roadways. Um, we have a situation in my district, really, uh, between Jamaica Plain and West Roxbury on Allendale Road, which runs perpendicular with Center Street near the Faulkner Hospital, where Allendale Woods, which has been clearly one of my favorite spots in the city, um, and many more people as we've uh, all taken advantage of from our great open space during pandemic, um, it's, it's really bisects JP and West Roxbury. It's, it's the dividing line. If you're driving down Allendale from Center Street to your right, Faulkner Hospital is Jamaica Plain. To your left, which are some residential areas, is West Roxbury, or actually part of it is Rosendale as well, but that's that we could have a whole meeting on the uh, neighborhood boundaries in Southwest Boston. However, what has been frustrating to many of us for many, many years is that the Jamaica Plain side is given GPOD protection, the West Roxbury side is not. Um, now this also seems counterintuitive because the bulk of Allendale Woods is actually on the West Roxbury side or heading towards West Roxbury, although it is still part of Jamaica Plain. So the purpose of this um, uh, amendment uh, to the uh, zoning code would simply allow us to basically fix what I think was an unintentional oversight uh, when this was originally drawn, um, provide the same pr protection and oversight. It does not prohibit uh, development or building. It simply allows for extra um, uh, set of sort of guidelines that a would-be project has to go through, um, but it's just simply making something that's fair. Right now, there are half of the, uh, of the uh, 
neighborhood is is given one set of protections and the other half are not. So this would just allow us to do our due diligence, have a proper hearing, submit the zoning code to the zoning commission, which would then vote on it. I'm not sure if the BP Day votes on it as well. It can be a very uh, long and uh, onerous process, but it begins with us. Uh, and it's an important way that we can rectify that and protect some of our great open land uh, here in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, would you please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Bach, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Wu, and Councillor Mejia. Did I get everyone? Please also add the chair. Docket 0217 will be referred to the Committee of Government Operations. We'll move on to Docket 0218. Docket 0218, Councillor O'Malley offered the following order for hearing to discuss phases of implementing net zero carbon requirements for all buildings in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. Um, the chair recognizes Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, uh, Madam President. This is a refile uh, several times over. I have been working on this with many of you, virtually all of you in uh, my entire time on this body. This being my last year, I'm hopeful that we will uh, certainly uh, have a, uh, a finished product. We are very close to getting there. Um, there's been some remarkable movement at the city level uh, as it relates to not only new municipal buildings, which will all be net zero carbon. We're already seeing that in some schools that are coming down the pipeline, as well as some other city, city buildings. Uh, but it's also going to change uh, what we hope will be the um, oversight on Article uh, 76, I believe, uh, of our new large scale development will be net zero carbon. So this is something that's really, really exciting. We want to continue this. We're we're also seeing efforts at the state level as well, as many of you know, and I know I've spoken with many of you about uh, the really important climate justice bill that was passed by the legislature, sadly vetoed by the governor, but it will likely be voted on again and hopefully passed tomorrow. That's another aspect that's going to change the, the stretch code. Simply put, this is going to mandate that buildings, which are our largest source of greenhouse gas em emissions, over 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Boston, uh, all of our greenhouse gas emissions in Boston come from our buildings. This is a way that we're going to build uh, cleaner, better, energy efficient, net zero carbon buildings, uh, which can be done, we can now say, at a less upfront cost, which will save significant money for tenants on utility bills going forward. Uh, it is the right thing to do. It is right for our planet, it is right for our builders, and right for our, our, our citizens as well, and our ratepayers. Um, so this is going to help facilitate uh, a finalized product. Um, we will continue working. The advocates with whom I have been standing shoulder to shoulder for the past decade in this movement uh, are too numerous to count, but I'm just so grateful for them and their leadership and the education they've given me and looking forward to continuing this and we'll continue um, with a working session in, in very short order. So uh, thank you again to all of my colleagues who've really expressed incredible interest in this and looking forward to your part, continued partnership in the months ahead. Thank you so much uh, for your, your advocacy and your leadership in this space. Show of physical hands for those who want to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor Bach, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Royo, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Wu. Please also add the chair. Docket 0218 will be referred to the Committee on Environment, Resiliency, and Parks. We'll move on to Docket 0219. Docket 0219, Councilor O'Malley offer the following order for hearing regarding installation of so solar panels on municipal parking lots and buildings. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor O'Malley. Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Before we proceed, I've just, uh, I'm wondering if um, we could just have a minute recess. I may have inadvertently asked that docket 217B, and apologies, this is all on me. I should have brought this up to you, but it seems to me that perhaps we could have voted on 217 as a resolution and bisect the... Or, or, yeah, is that the clerk is nodding her head. So I think I may have misspoken on that one. Um, I wonder if it's possible, could I move for first reconsideration on, 27, on docket 0217 for a vote in adoption? So, but this is not a resolution. This is an order. So are you looking to file a resolution? Um, no, I thought, um, can, Madam Clerk, do I have this incorrectly? You are nodding your head. Do we need to have a hearing on this? 
I, I was just suggesting that you just have to move for reconsideration. Okay. Um, you know, it would appear that it'd be going to government operations and perhaps that would be um, a question for right. the chair. You know, just, just out, of the abundance of, out of an abundance of caution, and I again apologize, colleagues, why don't we keep this where it is in government operations? And if indeed we need a hearing, we will have one, but otherwise we could perhaps vote on it. Um, remove the hearing. I apologize. That was. No worries. I should have known that. Um, thank you. May I now speak on docket 219? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, Actually, are we on? Uh, yes, we are on 219. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Madam President, um, and thank you, colleagues, for your indulgence. Um, this is obviously something that I think uh, is clearly the future, and as we talk about ways that we're making Boston the most energy efficient city we can, this is an easy way to do it. We can certainly look at ways that uh, Roxbury Community College, for example, built an incredible solar canopy over their expansive parking lot, um, which is able to help uh, support uh, their building and the, the, the incredible amount of energy that their buildings use. Uh, similarly, in my district, uh, the uh, Arnold Arboretum built a solar powered uh, or solar uh, arrays all through uh, what is known as Prouty's Hill, which is helping support their greenhouse and their research university. The fact of the matter is, is that solar and renewable energy, we need to build up our infrastructure. So why not look at ways that we can actually build it up well using city resources? We're talking about having PV panels on a number of new buildings coming down the pike. As we talk about net zero carbon construction, they will often be a huge part of what these buildings look like. But I want to take it one step further and really look at some of our municipal parking lots. Now, you can't build PV panels everywhere. Sometimes there are neighboring buildings that would prevent uh, a useful uh, a uh, useful placement for them, but there are still many, many, many municipal lots that would benefit by having uh, PV panels uh, serving as a canopy. So you wouldn't obviously lose any spots. Um, you would actually help uh, prevent, I'm looking out the window right now at the couple inches of snow we received last night, it would it'd help keep them clean. Um, it would also create energy that would then go back to help the cities defray some of its costs. So I want to begin by thanking Kate Reyes, who's a great constituent of mine, uh, who uh, met with me over coffee back when it was safe to do so last year. We were unable, obviously, to get it done, this hearing order last year, but this is a top priority for me as well. As we talk about how we're going to build back better post-pandemic, as we talk about not a return to normalcy, but is to truly build a better, more equitable, more just city, commonwealth, and country, uh, having uh, looking through as one of our lenses, uh, climate justice is part of it. And to get there, it has to be about having the infrastructure. It has to be having the supply. As many of you know, starting next week, uh, Community Choice Energy will officially be on the books in the city. I am so grateful to Councillor Wu uh, for her partnership and all of you for your support with that. Um, we need as a city, to, it, it is, um, it's incredibly disappointing how few uh, renewable energy resources we have, uh, particularly compared to so many other states. And admittedly, we're a smaller city, we're a cramped city, we're an older city, that's part of it as well. But that's not to say that we can't take some of this Boston ingenuity, this Boston spirit and building more. So let's get some solar canopies in not only our municipal buildings, which we've already been talking about, but in some of our municipal parking lots as well. It's going to sit, serve as a buffer and serve as a canopy and also create energy. Um, and, and quite frankly, dovetails nicely with the EV charging stations that we're gonna have in many of these lots as well. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Sabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you to the maker. I fully support exploring building more green infrastructure. I would like to encourage the maker and thank the maker for his work in this area, but to encourage him to be sure that BPS has a seat at the table for both dockets 218 and 219. As he noted in his remarks, BPS has been uh, doing this work, but as a large property, um, um, not owner, but a holder here in the city, when we think about the city's prop property, the work through the Boston Public Schools and through rebuilding um, BPS, there's a real opportunity to, to do this work in, in a greater way. Thank you to the maker. And Thank you so much. Not seeing any other speakers. So a show of physical hands to add your name to this docket. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Bach, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Wu, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Mejia, I think I got you. Um, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Sabi George, 
please also add the chair. Docket 0219 will be referred to the Committee on Environment, Resiliency, and Parks. We will move on to Docket 0220. Docket 0220, Councilor Wu offered the following order for hearing regarding green and social bonds. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Madam President, could I first make a motion to substitute the language to add our uh, chair of Ways and Means as an original co-sponsor to this? Seeing and hearing no objections. The substituted language, we will need to get that language though before the body. Is that language, uh, does central staff have that language if you have substituted yes. language? So we just wanna make sure that everyone has the opportunity to have that language before them. And who did you add um, as an original co-sponsor? Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach. Seeing and hearing no objections, the substituted language has been accepted and uh, Councillor Bach is an original co-sponsor. Okay, may I proceed or should we wait? For yes, the... please, I'm sorry. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I'm really excited to explore this specific tool to increase afford both affordable housing as well as get us closer to our climate goals Green and social bonds are a growing market worldwide and research shows that compared to the rates paid on the equivalent municipal bonds, the city of Boston can actually save money while using these bonds as a tool to drive investment in green and social housing. Uh, we know the numbers from our city's housing report of many thousands of new units and a specific goal of constructing 16,000 new units of income restricted housing by 2030. But based on the progress so far, it's clear that these units are not truly affordable to Boston residents, as only 9% of these have been affordable to the nearly half of our residents who earn less than 60% of AMI. So as we've talked about throughout this council meeting and with items that, that colleagues have filed earlier, it's clear that we need real public investment in truly affordable housing. And the pandemic has underscored the, the urgency of this. Housing is too important to leave solely to the private market and the city of Boston can do more to ensure new construction in Boston benefits residents. At the same time, uh, the many items that Councilor O'Malley just brought up as well, emphasize and point to his track record, uh, reminding us that buildings make up the largest portion of Boston's greenhouse gas emissions. And so as we invest in energy efficient and net zero buildings, we also need to make sure we're bringing these benefits to Boston residents at all parts of the income spectrum. Lower income Boston residents have the most to gain from green housing with lower utility bills, improved air quality, uh, reducing the, the odds of many urban um, uh, disproportionately um, burdensome diseases and illnesses and, and medical conditions that our communities of color and residents of color must live with currently. So as we work to meet our city's climate goals, we have a unique opportunity to leverage green and social bonds, make sure we're meeting our housing goals and center our Boston residents, low-income communities, and black and brown families at the forefront of any new projects. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Madam President, and thank you uh, to Councilor Wu um, uh, for partnering on this. Um, people have heard me say it before, but I really think our capital budget, we have to be using it in a counter-cyclical way and in a way that um, promotes our core like goals and values as a city. And I think that climate justice and housing justice, um, that our climate plan and our affordable housing plan, those are two central things, they should be intertwined. Um, and I really wanna commend our treasury department for um, doing this first round of green and social bonds this year. Um, and also for showing that green bonds could actually um, fetch a pricing benefit uh, in the market because um, as Councilor Wu said, that really opens up the way to um, to being more aggressive. And I think that we have an opportunity, we're well below our debt limit um, in terms of what we actually get out the door on capital spending. Um, and this is a time for us to be building green housing that's owned by the public. Um, I've been here before and I will be here again talking about public housing specifically on that front. Um, but, uh, but there's really a much richer tradition of social housing of all types. Um, you see it over in Europe and other places. And I think that um, when you think about the opportunity for the city to really grow its capital commitment in housing, something that we've only started to do in a serious way in the last few years. Um, it's sort of a question of going from the pilot phase of having a little piece of our capital budget that's for housing and having a little piece of our bond offering that's green and social 
to kind of cracking that open um, and using it as a major lever um, to move the city forward on both these fronts. So excited for this hearing and uh, grateful to Councillor Wu for her partnership. Thank you. Not seeing any other speakers, a show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Royo, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Campbell. Councillor Mejia, I got you. I don't know if you're frozen. Uh, did I get everyone? Please also add the chair. Docket 0220 will be referred to the committee on post audit and we'll move on to docket 0221. Madam Clerk, I believe you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, docket 0221, Councilors Flynn and Mejia offer the following order for a hearing to discuss internet access and digital equity in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, may I suspend Rule 12 and out Councillor um, Bach as an original co-sponsor? Seeing and hearing no objections, Councillor Bach is added as an original co-sponsor. Please continue. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, education, business, work, and other services are now increasingly reliant on the internet and with COVID-19 pandemic, having internet access and knowing how to use the computer, digital resources is now a necessity for so many. We held a hearing last year in this matter and it's clear that this is an important issue, especially during this pan pandemic. Families, our immigrant communities, our communities of color, our seniors, persons with disabilities are most likely to have issues with lack of internet access and knowledge of uh, digital skills. We need to ensure that those residents have the resources that they need to uh, stay active in this changing economy and with technology as well. Um, thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Madam President. And thank you to my co-sponsors, Councillor Flynn and Bach. Um, times are stressful enough as is without having to worry about whether your child can participate in their education or whether you will have to have enough um, bandwidth to do your own job. Working families are um, competing for the bandwidth and that, com that compromises everyone's ability to, uh, to go to school, work, and even enjoy some downtime. We need to fight for better internet access across the city and in and, and every home. And we look forward to holding this hearing. And as we think about um, expanding access to digital equity, we also must be super mindful that um, when it comes to uh, the digital divide, the, those who have the least are being the most impacted. So looking forward to having this conversation. Um, and I, again, I thank my um, co-sponsors for their partnership. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and thanks so much to my co-sponsors, uh, Councillor Flynn and Mejia, um, for letting me partner with them on this. Uh, you know, internet's becoming for the modern city as essential a public utility as water and sewer. Um, and as my colleagues have said, the current pandemic's left far too many residents without internet access, locked out of school, public meetings, critical information and key services. Um, so I really think it's important for us to be partnering to explore how we increase digital equity in Boston, including, and I wanna emphasize this through solutions like municipal broadband. Um, this is something my office has been doing a bunch of um, research work on. I think that like private railroads and sewers, um, which proliferated at the beginning stages of each of those technology, the, each of those technologies, private internet infrastructure will not make sense in the long term. Um, that sounds, you know, right now like a real disruption of an industry. But like I said, you used to have a lot of people running a private railroad when the thing got started. You had this idea that everyone was going to build a private sewer just for themselves and their block. And we've all seen um, in the South End and other places around the city how badly a private sewer works out. Um, similarly, you know, there's the internet technology that we rely on has relied mainly initially on um, private infrastructure, um, but it's just, it's not efficient and it's not a way to get a core utility that people need for every aspect of their lives to people reliably um, in a way that doesn't lock folks 
out of our very society because of price, I think in the long term. So, um, you know, there's a powerful civil civic argument at play about moving past costly private control over this critical resource, I think for the sake of democratic equality. Um, and so, you know, I think that this, I hope is something where we can go from looking at the symptoms that we're seeing of digital inequity in this moment of the pandemic um, to a real shift in our structural solution. So really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, could you please add my name to, as a co-sponsor for this? And um, I just wanted to voice my strong support and gratitude to all of the um, sponsors for their leadership here. We know that one in five Boston households do not have a home internet subscription. And of course, during the pandemic, we have seen just what that means and how we are deepening disparities and injustices across the city. And so I really appreciate this hearing order being put forward because it's the time not just to put band-aids on and make sure we're addressing the immediate crisis, but plan for the long term, as the sponsors have said. Um, you know, I am, I am part of the, the BPS community as a parent and know that the distribution of Chromebooks was a tremendous task. A lot of work, a lot of coordination, and a huge accomplishment done for the city, of course, with bumps and the need to center equity and outreach and make sure no student falls through any gaps. But the fact that we got that done really shows what's possible when the city decides to address these big issues. And so eager to keep expanding that with this, with this push. Thank you very much. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, please add my name to this um, to this hearing order. Um, I, I also, you know, we're very aware COVID has 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 exposed so many of the inequities in our system. Uh, we we very very cognizant of of the impacts of lack of good internet access to inner learning inner student population or our school kids. But also, um, as a person who's come from a background in healthcare, I want to also flag up the need for internet access that's affordable and easy to use for elders and folks who, with, with disabilities who rely on it, increasingly rely on it for telehealth and to be able to um, have their, uh, be supervised by a medical profession professional from uh, while they're at home um, and this is this is a trend that that uh, is is the way of the future telehealth has arrived and if um, our population especially our low-income population doesn't have access to good internet then it will only increase the inequities they already know that, that are in the system so please add my name thank you excellent thank you the chair recognizes councillor campbell councillor campbell you have the floor um, thank you, Madam President. I'll be quick. I just want to absolutely thank the makers for continuing this conversation, which of course is critically important. The digital, digital divide, of course, has existed for generations. But I also want to lift up Do It um, and, the, and the team at Do It for the work they've done to close the gap, particularly in, in partnership with the Housing Authority to try to make sure our seniors have access um, and doing the best they can. I also want to thank Tech Goes Home. They've been out there doing training and technical assistance with so many folks. And I also want to thank uh, those in the private sector for supporting you know, Tech Goes Home and other nonprofits who've been doing this work, um, and particularly lately given COVID-19. And then lastly, I'll just say, and I think others have said it, you know, and Councillor Braden, just you know, telehealth is, is, is definitely the way of the future. Um, of course, education, Boston Public Schools, but jobs, right? There are folks right now who are not connected and who are in the process of trying to find jobs and are struggling to do that because they do not have access uh, to Wi-Fi, hardware or software. So just really wanted to applaud the makers. Um, thank you, Madam President, please add my name. Thank you so much. A show of physical hands, please, for others who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, um, if you could please add Councillor Edwards, Councillor Braden, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Mejia, I'm just checking your hands up, but I'm not okay. Councillor Mejia, please also add the chair. Did I get everyone? Yeah. Wonderful. Docket 0221 will be referred to the Committee on City and Neighborhood Services. We will move on to Docket 0222. Docket 0222, Council of Flynn offered the following order for hearing to discuss water rescue infrastructure in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council of Flynn. Thank you, 
Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, may I add Councilor Edwards as an original co-sponsor, please? Seeing and hearing no objections, Councilor Edwards is added. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, I'm filing this, we're, we're, we're filing this hearing order to discuss safety around our piers, marinas, docks, other areas of access to water, to dis discuss how we can have water rescue measures in place when there are accidents. Um, we're a city surrounded by water. And over the years with the increase of visitors and tourists to our city, we unfortunately see incidents of people falling into the water. It happens all over the city. It might be, um, it might be in the Fort Point area. It might be around the New England Aquarium area. Um, Dorchester is surrounded by water. Obviously, Charlestown in, in East Boston and along the Charles River, some of the neighborhoods along the Charles River also. Um, res residents in the Fort Point actually advocated for a life-saving rink to be installed at Fort Point Pier near the public docks in case of accidents. Um, and it was their recommendation to me to actually have this hearing order. So I wanna say thank you to the Fort Point Neighborhood, Neighborhood Associations. Um, so I think it's important that we work with our law enforcement, water rescue units and state agencies, city agencies in the US Coast Guard that plays a critical role in and around, the, in and around Boston Harbor. Um, I have had the opportunity to serve 24 years in the US Navy but I also have seen a lot of tragedies over the years as well in and around the ocean. So I just want to see, I want, I want us to come together and discuss a plan of how we can make the, um, make our city safer for people that um, might be in and around the ocean. Um, thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much um, uh, to my uh, co-sponsor, Councilor Flynn. Um, very, just very briefly, as uh, Councilor Flynn noted, I, my, my district has a great deal of waterfront property. Uh, actually, while I was a city councilor, there was a um, fire in Charlestown on, in the marina. And so just going back to that and making sure we have resources and also that we have a good um, conversation with Massport present. Thank you very much. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Asabi George, you have the floor. Uh, thank you again, Madam President. Thank you to the makers for uh, this hearing order. This is a serious issue. We definitely need to look at our rescue infrastructure. A related issue would also be making sure that everyone knows how to swim and making it a graduation in the Boston Public Schools. Obviously, that this won't solve the intricate problems presented in water rescues, but it certainly would be beneficial to everyone to feel more comfortable in the water. And as we are a harbor city, I think it's so incredibly important, so important that our uh, young people learn how to swim, um, our adults as well, if they didn't learn to swim as children. We have great water resources, both our harbor, our beaches, and um, the pools that are both owned and operated by the city and um, private enterprise. So just uh, excited about uh, this topic as I think it's incredibly important as a Harbor City that we are discussing this, both from a water safety perspective and um, how it could also change the way that we um, perhaps uh, teach our young kids, our young people how to swim. Thank you. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to thank uh, the makers. As someone who um, learned how to, well, I almost swim at the Marshall because we had a pool, um, but I, I was only until the fifth grade and um, I, I, I'm not an avid swimmer. I actually am afraid to swim. Really important and really do appreciate um, having this conversation and looking forward to supporting the conversation. So please add my name, thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I commend the author and obviously would like to have my name added. Uh, the vital critical role that both our police and fire uh, marine units uh, lend to the city is it's tremendous and on a public safety standpoint, whether it's the LNG tankers that come into Boston Harbor, uh, whether it's search and rescue that takes place pretty regularly, whether there's a boating accident or we saw uh, as recent as this summer where a, a car went off uh, into the channel uh, and it was, I believe it was our, uh, our Boston Fire um, 
Marine Rescue Unit that, that was able to do the recovery. So uh, they play a critical and vital role. And in addition to that, you know, if we're going to have um, a situation um, where we're going to have an extreme, um, whether it's a flood or some type of incident that we've seen in other parts of the country, uh, the water penetration will be coming up uh, the reserve channel and Fort Point channel, which arguably is ground zero for both our police and fire marine units. So uh, they may have to uh, assist uh, in an environmental situation as well. So uh, happy to have the conversation. Look forward to the hearing. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Not seeing any other speakers. We will move on to those who want to add their name by a show of physical hands. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Wu, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Bach, and please also add the chair. Our docket 0222 will be referred to the Committee on City and Neighborhood Services. And at this time, I will turn the chair over to the Vice Chair, Councillor O'Malley. Uh, Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please read into the record and place before the body docket 0223. Thank you. Docket 0223, Council of Flynn offer the following order for hearing to discuss public health disparities in Boston communities of color. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The chair now recognizes the council from South Boston. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, may I suspend Rule 12 and add President Janey and Councilor Arroyo as original co-sponsors? Certainly, we will add the Council President as an original co-sponsor without uh, suspending Rule 12, and then we will suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Arroyo as the third co-sponsor. Please proceed. Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, this is actually a refile order uh, from, from last year and two years ago. Um, health disparities in our communities of color have been a long problem um, in our city, but with COVID-19, we again see the health disparities in our communities of color, where we see our black and Latinx residents being disproportionately impacted by the virus in terms of infection rate and hospitalization rate mortality rate. Um, I work with almost every city councilor on this issue and last year visited the um, domestic violence um, unit with the Boston police and with Councilor Campbell. And that was one of the main issues that the, the, um, the staff noted to both myself and Councilor Campbell is the um, public health um, challenges that are prevalent in so many um, communities of color. Uh, research has shown that Asian Americans, Lat Latinx, and African American residents of Boston significantly more likely to experience a number of troubling health conditions, HIV infection, diabetes, heart disease, asthma. With this pandemic, it's especially important that we continue to talk about this issue, to work closely with our public health professionals, learn more about this, in making sure or trying to make sure that we do all we can to address this growing um, growing problem in our city. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. The chair now recognizes the council president. Councillor Janey, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice President. I wanna start by thanking um, the lead sponsor, Councillor Flynn for his advocacy and for his leadership on this issue, for inviting me to partner uh, two years ago, and again last year, also want to thank Councilor Arroyo uh, for his partnership and leadership in this space as chair of the Public Health Committee, and also as the first on this body to 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 say that racism was a pu public health crisis. And who knew at that time during his maiden speech, what like just a year ago almost, uh, that we would be dealing with a pandemic a full year later. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what COVID-19 has done, what many of us have said, it has exposed um, the inequities that were already there. And for communities of color, they are stark. Um, in if my district alone, um, there is a 30 year life expectancy gap from Symphony Hall to Grove Hall. And in every measure, those in my district um, whether we're looking at infant mortality, whether we're looking at 
uh, Black maternal health, whether we're looking at emergency room visits, we're looking at asthma, diabetes, HIV, the list goes on. We see the disparities here. And so it is very important that we uh, deal with these inequities. We can't just get through the pandemic and think we're going back to normal because we need to make sure that we are closing these gaps. And so I'm just grateful for the opportunity to partner, uh, not only with the makers of this uh, hearing order, but with all of you so that we are addressing uh, the public health crisis facing us. And it's not just COVID-19, it's all of these underlying issues that were there before the pandemic. So again, grateful and looking forward to having a hearing where we can dig deeper into this and come up with real solutions. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Councilor Flanning. Thank you, Councilor Arroyo. Thank you, Madam President. The Chair now recognizes the District Council from Hyde Park. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, racism as a public health crisis had everything to do with specifically these issues. Um, and I think, you know, it's been clear that the COVID pandemic <clears throat> pandemic has made all of these issues uh, front and center, all these disparities. Uh, and I want to make sure that, you know, I said it then and I'll say it now. These issues, when we're talking about asthma, infant mortality, obesity, hypertension, hepatitis, low birth weights, diabetes, when we're talking about those things, folks tend to discuss them as though they're personal deficiencies, as though we're talking about uh, uh, personal responsibility issues here and that certain communities may not be as personally responsible. And the reality is what is driving these issues is the environments that they're in, whether that's their socioeconomic environment and the policies that create that, whether we're talking about uh, environmental pollution uh, and, and uh, policy around that, and whether we're talking about, which, which obviously has to do with asthma. And when we're talking about the way that we address these issues, we have to address them holistically. Uh, and so my hope is with this hearing that we not just continue to uh, shame and name the processes and the things that are doing this, but we also come together uh, and create solutions to really address these issues because our people are literally dying. Um, that's, that's just where we're at. They're, they're actually dying. And when we talk about infant mortality uh, and we talk about uh, Black maternal health and when we talk about just the things that folks take for granted, like when I tell my doctor that something is wrong with me, they will believe me and they will not send me home and say that this person does not know what's going on with their body when we've seen studies and data that show that Black women are commonly misbelieved when they report real issues with their health. Uh, and so these are the kinds of things that I hope we start to really push into and lean into. Um, I commend Ed Flynn, uh, Councillor Flynn, for really leaning into this conversation. And I hope that as a body, we can start to push all of these separate holistic pieces towards really doing the work that we need them to do to, to make a real difference in, in people's health and lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Royal. Uh, is there any further discussion on docket 0223? Uh, oh, excuse me. Yes, uh, the chair now recognizes the at-large counselor from South Boston. Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, please add my name. I want to thank the, uh, the lead sponsor and co-sponsors for this and um, continue that effort and they continue to, to address these issues. And one thing that uh, I've talked about, um, I know that we were on the call early on uh, in the summer with the, uh, the regular um, COVID, the pandemic calls was that there's something that we can do uh, and we should continue to do. And I know that uh, I've worked uh, closely with colleagues in the past and Council Flynn and I have talked about uh, renewing that effort, but uh, making sure that uh, we reach out to as many of our constituents as possible and encourage them uh, to, uh, to get on Mass Health and or participate and get involved with their local community health center and or uh, get a primary care physician. That's a big piece of, uh, I think, uh, of dealing with uh, the issues around um, the healthcare disparity. So willing to partner with any of my district colleagues. Uh, I know that we did one, uh, we had a successful effort uh, several years ago in, in my community and uh, we'll work with any of my colleagues to try to make that happen in partnership with our local community health centers in an effort to try to get as many folks on the health rolls as possible. Uh, that's a big factor here. And then um, and get the folks primary care and then address uh, some of the underlying issues. But uh, as the previous speaker had mentioned, obviously having folks uh, being believed is a big piece of that as well, but getting folks to walk in the door uh, and feel comfortable is another piece of it. And I think that we all as leaders in our respective communities um, and, uh, and the relationships that we have at our community health centers, I think we could make a huge difference in getting more folks um, uh, connected to healthcare options. So 
Thank you, and I look forward to having the hearing. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Michael Flaherty as a co-sponsor. The chair now recognizes the at-large council from Dorchester, Councillor Anissa Saibi George. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, and please add my name. I'd like to thank the maker and co-sponsors for this hearing order. We need to do more to uh, equitably expand health access and health and to health care itself. I'd like to make sure and remind um, the makers to invite the community health centers to be part of this conversation. They are critical components of our health care system and are deeply rooted in the communities as they serve those communities. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Saibi George. Uh, seeing and hearing no further discussion, if any councillors would wish to add their name, please raise their hand now. Madam Clerk, uh, please add Councillor Saibi George. Please add Councillor Liz Braden. Please add Councillor Lydia Edwards. Please add Councillor Michelle Wu. Please add Councillor Julia Mejia. Please add Councillor Andrea Campbell. Please add Councillor Kenzie Bach. We've added Councillor Michael Flaherty. Uh, please add my name, Madam Chair. And docket 0223 shall be referred to the Committee on Public Health. Madam President, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice President. We will now move on to docket 0224. Docket 0224, Council of Flynn offer the following order for hearing to discuss renewal fees for restaurants and food establishments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, this is a refile. I will be very brief. As we know, restaurants and food establishments are struggling. This is an opportunity for us to learn more and talk to them about what assistance, if any, um, the city might be able to provide to them, whether it's relating to uh, fees or licenses um, I look forward to working with the Mass Restaurant Association and with my colleagues and with the mayor's office. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Um, would anyone like to add their name? Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Edwards, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Wu, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Braden, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Sabi George. Did I get everyone who wants to be added? Please also add the chair. Docket two two four. Docket zero two two four will be referred to the committee on small business and workforce development. Madam Clerk, could you please read docket zero two two five? Thank you. Docket 0225, Council of Flynn offer the following order for hearing to discuss ways the city, for the city to be more proactive in providing services, educating the public, and raising awareness of those infected with HIV AIDS. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, I, I, I didn't hear the um, hear all of it, but my, I'm, can I add Council of Flaherty as an original co-sponsor? Uh, seeing and hearing no objections, Council of Flaherty is added as an original co-sponsor. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, this is another refile from last year. We want to continue the conversation about how the city can be more, more proactive in providing services, educating the public, raising awareness uh, for those living with HIV AIDS. Uh, with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, there are growing concerns and a surge in HIV infections in Boston, particularly among the most vulnerable, including the homeless population. Um, HIV, all, HIV slash AIDS also impacts communities of color, as 65% of those diagnosed with HIV are communities of color. Um, it is therefore critical that we are proactive in providing programs and services to, to those who are living with HIV and AIDS and those who are at high risk of infection. Um, I hope that we can continue to have a conversation with our public health officials, advocates, uh, providers, residents. Um, I just also, also wanna highlight the as Councillor Sabi George mentioned, but as it relates to HIV and AIDS, our community health centers play a critical role, including two that are in my district, 
um, the South Boston Community Health Center. Uh, Fenway Community Health Center has a presence now in Chinatown. And East Boston Health Center um, has merged with the South End Community Health Center. So all of the health centers really across Boston are playing a critical role on this, on this issue. Um, so again, looking forward to the conversation and working with our public health professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and thank you to the lead sponsor for uh, uh, including me, obviously, and recognizing my, my work in the space over, over time. Uh, it's so critical that we continue uh, to work together uh, as particularly as we're battling the COVID-19 pandemic and still raise awareness about uh, HIV AIDS to ensure uh, proactive education and care is provided to uh, constituents across the city. So you know that, and it's been referenced that many of our community health centers and community partners are at the forefront of this work. Um, and I can imagine that the pandemic has presented new challenges uh, to them, uh, particularly as they're trying to reach clients and provide proactive care. Um, that said, I also wanna give a shout out to Fenway Community Health Center who back in 1981 uh, made the first diagnosis of AIDS in New England, and they've been a leader in that space, uh, particularly in AIDS treatment uh, ever since. So we're lucky uh, that uh, they're here with us in Boston and they've taken the lead. And uh, also want to recognize our other community health partners as well. Uh, we boast of having the best hospitals and network of community health centers in the world. So I look forward to working with them, um, the Boston, and along with the Boston Public Health Commission and any other stakeholders that want to make a difference uh, in this regard. So we look forward to the hearing and, and thanks again to the lead sponsor for including me. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Not seeing anyone else who would like to speak a show of physical hands, please, for those who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Royo, Councilor Braden, Councilor Bach, Councilor Wu. Did I get everyone who would like to be added? Please also add the chair, a docket 0225. Is this 0225? It is. Wonderful, 0225 will be referred to the Committee on Public Health. We will move on to docket 0226. 0226. Councilor Bach offer the following order for hearing regarding a mid-year update on the city's FY21 fiscal status. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this hearing I'm hoping to have in the next 10 days, um, and the goal really is we're halfway through, we're now almost seven months through um, the city's FY21 budget. Um, and I think, you know, it would in ordinary times make sense to get something of an update for the council about where finances stand um, and where we are on the budget. But uh, it makes a special sense this year because uh, at the time at which we passed the budget, there were a lot there were lots of revenue uncertainties and there have been lots of developments since. Um, so we continue to have uncertainty about excise taxes. Certain numbers came in below expectation than other things like our property tax base got certified. At, um, at strong levels. We, I mentioned already the strong bond offering by the city. Um, and then there's quite a lot of um, CARES and other related federal funds related to the COVID crisis. Um, folks will remember that in council back in May, we authorized a um, $100 million uh, CARES, um, more than 100, uh, CARES Act appropriation for the city to use on emergency matters. And that was meant to be all spent by December 31st, but then uh, the law that passed Congress in the final few days of December actually extended that deadline. Um, and recently the president has signed um, executive orders that allow FEMA to uh, reimburse the city for up to 100% rather than 75% for a bunch of um, a bunch of COVID related costs, things like uh, PPE and, and making schools safe and stuff. So basically, the number of moving pieces here um, means that I think it's really incumbent upon us uh, and our kind of financial oversight and stewardship powers um, to ask the city budget and ANF folks to come and give us an update on where all these pieces are and kind of what the fiscal status uh, of the city is. So I'm looking forward to doing that shortly. Um, and uh, I think it's 
it's not going to be a hearing about the upcoming FY22 budget, but it's an opportunity for the whole council to kind of have a better feel for where we stand going into that process. So thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Um, not seeing anyone else who would like to speak. A show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add uh, Council O'Malley, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Asabi George, Councillor Braden, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Wu, Councillor Flynn, did I get Councillor Arroyo? Did I get everyone? Please also add the chair. Um, Docket 0226 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And we'll move on to no. Docket 0227. Thank you. Docket 0227, Councilor Edwards offered the following ordinance reauthorizing condominium protections in the city of Boston. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Edwards. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, last year, the uh, administration introduced this for the deadline of January 31st. We're just reintroducing it with a new deadline of March 31st. I would ask um, the permission, with the permission of the president, uh, Madam President, that we uh, could suspend and pass and put in the new date. And put in what? The new date. Yes. The new date. So, uh, Councillor Edwards would like for us to suspend to suspend the rules and pass this docket. Um, Madam Clerk, we'll have to call the roll on this. Would you like to say anything else on that? Just again, uh, this was introduced last year. We were in the middle of a good conversation. And on the deadline, we were supposed to end it on January 31st of this year. We're still in good conversation. Later, there's another docket and for the conversation. Okay. Not seeing uh, any discussion on this. Uh, Councillor Edward, oh, yes, there is discussion. <laughs> the chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, Madam President. I just wanted to underscore the fact that um, we would not want the people of Boston to lose these important protections um, that keep people from losing their homes because of kind of, you know, predatory condo conversion actions. Um, and so I just think that as those policy conversations continue about how there's a more robust plan going forward, um, I think it's really important for us to extend this date and not let it lapse in four days. So I just want to strongly support the move to suspend and pass today. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Before we do that, this is still a docket before us. I want to give it, get a show of hands of people who would like to add on. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Wu, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Royo, Councilor Bach. Please also add the chair. Did I get Councilor O'Malley? Did I get everyone who would like to be added? Please add the chair. At this time, please add Councilor Mejia. At this Thank time, you. Councillor Edwards uh, is seeking suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0227. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Councillor Arroyo for docket number 0227. Yes. Councillor Arroyo, yes. Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach. Yes. Councillor Bach, yes. Councillor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Yes. Councilor O'Malley. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we, we have it. Thank you. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Um, Madam President, docket 0227 has passed. Thank you so much. Docket 0227 has passed. So we will move on to docket 0228. Docket 0228, Councilor Asabi George offered the following ordinance relative to the establishment of an independent mental health commission. 
Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Asabi George, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. This ordinance has been significantly updated with the help of several key players in my mental health commission or my mental health roundtable. The hope for this commission is that we as a city will take mental health more seriously, destigmatize it, review our current mental health resources, and determine ways to dramatically improve access to mental health care. The pandemic has shown all of us that taking care of our mental health is as important as taking care of our physical health, physical health for everyone at every age. There exists real barriers for many, particularly people of color, to, to regularly access high quality mental health care. Sometimes the barriers are cultural or generational. Sometimes there's issues about, you know, family, sort of family issues. And, you know, when I was younger, my dad would say things like, it's all in your head. And I'd say, yes, that is a true statement. But many of our uh, ethnic and cultural and racial groups uh, see too much stigma around uh, mental health issues. What is clear to me to be mental health care providers, what's clear to me and to mental health care providers and to so many others is that we all have to contend with our own mental health if we want to live full lives. And doing so is a service to ourselves as much as it is to our families and our communities. I look forward to having a public conversation about the responsibilities of this commission and the work that this co commission could achieve. Thank you, Madam President. You're on mute, Madam. Thank you. Uh, would anyone like to add their name to this docket? Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Braden, Councillor Royo, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Wu, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Bach. Please also add the chair. Did I get everyone? Okay, great. Docket 0228 will be referred to the Committee of Government Operations. We'll move on to Docket 0229. Docket 0229, Councilor Asabi George offered the following order for hearing regarding act access to wellness programs for first responders. The chair recognizes Councilor Asabi George. Councilor Asabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. This is a refile from last year. Being a first responder is inherently stressful and oftentimes traumatic. If we don't ensure that our first responders have adequate wellness programming and a supportive work environment to handle their men mental and physical health, then they are more predisposed to suicide and domestic violence. Currently, there is a disparity between available programs across departments and generally stigma in utilizing these resources. Hopefully this hearing will help change that experience. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Would anyone like to add their name? A show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Royo, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Wu, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden. Did I get everyone who would like to be added? Please also add the chair. Docket 0229 will be referred to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Madam Clerk, would you please read Docket 0230? Docket 0230, Councilor Sabi George offer the following order for hearing regarding the expansion of the Boston Emergency Services Team. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Sabi George. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Last year, we held a hearing on the impact of the new funding for the best clinicians. I refile this hearing order again because I want to make sure that we continue this conversation and to review some of the developments in the last few months since the funding has been put in place and we've uh, started hiring best clinicians. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to add their name? Show of physical hands. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Royo. Did I get everyone who would like to add their name? Please also add the chair. Wonderful. 
Uh, docket 0230 will be referred to the Committee of Public Safety and Criminal Justice. We'll move on to docket 0231. Madam President, would you like me to read docket 0231 through 0233? Uh, yes, these are all the same sponsor. Is that good with you, uh, Councillor Sarby George? Wonderful. Yes, so if you would, that would be great. In Thank fact. you. Docket 0231, Councillor Sarby George offered the following order for hearing to examine mental health and suicide prevention resources in the city of Boston. Docket number 0232. Councillor Sabi George offered the following order for hearing regarding the impact of COVID-19 on recovery services. And docket number 0233, Councillor Sabi George offered the following order for hearing regarding the opioid crisis. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you again, Madam President. Dockets 0231 and 0233 are refiles from last year and 0232 is new. 0231 is a hearing order to look at city services to prevent suicide. 0233 will give us an opportunity to learn about the challenges we are facing with the opioid crisis at Mass and Cass. COVID obviously has made an impact on uh, suicide prevention work and how we are responding as well to the opioid crisis. But it has also created additional pressure on our recovery services. 0233 aims to lift up some of those challenges so that we can ensure that the pandemic doesn't reduce our capacity to support folks in recovery. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Not seeing anyone who would like to speak, I will uh, give folks the opportunity to sign on to each individual docket. Uh, why don't we take them one at a time? Docket 0231, show of physical hands, Madam Clerk. P please add Councillors O'Malley, Flynn, Mejia, Edwards, Flaherty, Braden, Wu, Arroyo, Bach, and the Chair. Um, for Docket 0232, show of physical hands to add your name to this docket. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor O'Malley, Flynn, Wu, Braden, Flaherty, Edwards, Mejia, Bach, Arroyo, and please also add the chair. For docket 0233, show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add uh, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Braden, Councillor Wu, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach, Councillor O'Malley, please add the chair as well. Dockets 0231, 0232, and 0233 will all be referred to the Committee of Public Health. Madam Clerk, if you could please read docket 0234. Docket 0234, Councilor Sabi George offered the following order for hearing to review the women's specific outreach and healthcare programming to combat the opiate, opioid crisis. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Asabi George. Thank you, Madam President. This is a, a also a refile from last year, but the need for this conversation has grown significantly. We are unfortunately seeing more young women dealing with substance use disorders for the first time. Homeless single women are dealing with many issues, but they are also dealing with sexual assaults happening with greater frequency. Women also have unique challenges, including pregnancy complications, hepatitis C infections, HIV prevalence, and bias due to their gender, particularly for transgender women. Many of our residents dealing with substance use disorders are also unhoused. Healthcare for the homeless is asking for us to consider some short-term changes to our outreach programs and shelter system to provide better support services. Some ideas that have been discussed are having more women-specific spaces or drop-in hours, a mobile van that is safe, a safe, warm space where women can access medical care 24 hours a day, more re resources for rapid rehousing into supportive housing, and more regular access to showers and laundry machines. What's clear is that we need to, do, need to be doing so much more in the short term and in the long term to support our residents dealing with substance use disorders and their unique experiences and circumstances, especially those unique experiences and circumstances for women. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name. 
Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Royal, Councillor Wu, Councillor Braden, Councillor Edwards, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Mejia, and Councillor Bach. Please also add the chair. Docket 0234 will be referred to the Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities. We'll go on to Docket 0235, please. Docket 0235, Councilors Baker and Asabi Dord are for the following resolution in support of naming the community room in the Adams Street Library, the Patricia O'Neill Community Room. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Asabi George. Councilor Asabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Flaherty as a third original co-sponsor. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councilor Flaherty has been added. Please Thank continue. you very much. Pat, Pat O'Neill was a longtime resident of Boston, more specifically of Dorchester, and a friend of mine. She passed away last year from COVID and this body closed in her memory uh, and shared some wonderful reflections and remembrances of her at that time. This resolution today supports an effort to name the Adam Street Library community room after her in recognition of all she has done and given and offered to our neighborhood. I ask that we suspend the rules and pass this resolution. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Obviously, thanks to the previous speaker and our colleague, Council Baker, for including me. I had the great fortune uh, of knowing uh, Pat O'Neill, and Pat O'Neill is one of the folks that, um, if you're deciding to run for public office, whether you're running for a seat in Dorchester or you're running at large, that she was one of the first people that you wanted to at least meet. And and um, and I had sort of that path um, cleared for me because I had the great fortune of going to BCI with uh, with her son uh, David. So. Uh, as a result of that, um, that transition and that introduction was well, and so a lot has been a lot has been said about Pat O'Neill, and uh, just have to say that she's been the driving force uh, behind a lot of events in Dorchester, particularly as it pertains to uh, the section of Ashmont and uh, her annual uh, Dorchester Chili Cookoff is something that comes to mind, as well as her steadfast support for the Dorchester Day Parade. She served on so many um, holiday uh, celebration committees for the tree lightings. It just it's endless. Her commitment and her love and her passion uh, for her beloved Dorchester, uh, it's more than fitting uh, that this occur. And so I uh, look forward to uh, making this resolution, obviously uh, adopting, uh, suspending and adopting this resolution, but also making uh, the Pat O'Neill Community Room a reality uh, for all the great people of Dorchester to remember her service uh, to community and to our city over the years. And so uh, her accolades and all of the involvement is too voluminous to, uh, to sort of go through every single one. But uh, she was a force, and uh, she obviously leaves uh, a great family behind. So um, uh, please, uh, obviously, encourage, let me encourage all of my colleagues to, to join in uh, supporting this resolution and, and move for suspension and adoption. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor O'Malley. Councilor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I know it's been a long meeting, but I, I wanted to speak on this particular and obviously add my, my full full throated support. Um, I'm, I'm getting a little wistful in my, in my old age. And as I come up on my last year serving as a member of this body, I'm, I'm thinking back to the, uh, prior times that I ran, um, unsuccessfully behind me is a sign from 2003 to 17 years ago or 18 years ago. Now, when I was 23 years old and first ran for office and the first civic association meeting I attended outside of my neighborhood was uh, right off of Westmoreland Street in Dorchester, the clerk, uh, then, then council president, or not even council president at that point, just a city councilor at that time, Maureen Feeney was there. And it was Pat O'Neill holding court with the Ashmont Adams Neighbor Association. And she and just Della and Judy and so many of uh, Tom, so many, Mike, so many of her great uh, neighbors were so kind to me that I attended every Ashmont Adams Neighborhood Association meeting that campaign lost and came back after I lost uh, with a box of Joe and some donuts because I promised that I would. Um, and, you know, this is, I, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. This, this business is great. It's hard. And you think about the people that you meet um, that make it worthwhile, the people that, that stand with you and take the time to support you. And, you know, Pat was just such an amazing friend to me. And even though I then ran district, uh, she, I still counted her among my, my, my best supporters. Uh, I loved her and, you know, Pat loved this body. She, 
her husband, David, ran for city council when he was 23, unsuccessfully, but that was always a connection that we had had. And he, he passed away a couple of years ago. So I know they're together now, but she was just a remarkable woman. And you think about, you just think about the people that you might not know their names, um, although everyone knew, everyone knew Pat's name, but you just think about the people who don't do this for any glory other than serving their community. Um, and she was just an amazing woman. And this is, this is one of, I hope, many, many uh, ways to honor her memory and her legacy. She was, uh, she was a true daughter of this city and a great friend to all of us, whether you knew her or not. Um, so thank you, Councilor Savi George. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Um, I'll just close with this, you know, as trying to run at large, you know, it's very, very difficult, especially when you're not known in a neighborhood. So Pat did a house party for me, Judy. Tuttle did a house party for me. Della did a house party for me. Mike did, did a house party for me. And it was the same people showing up at all the same house parties. And it just turned into us having some wine and cheese and having a great time. But um, thank you, Pat. And thank you, Anissa and Frank and Michael for putting this forward. Thanks. Thanks for letting me go on a bit. Thank you so much uh, for that tribute. A show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name to this resolution. Madam Clerk, if you could please add, sorry. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Braden, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Bach, Councilor Wu, please also add the chair. Councilors Baker, Asabi George, and Flaherty seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0235. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach? Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Brayton? Yes. Let's take. Yes. Let's take. Recess. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'll be, uh, I'm just, uh, <laughs> okay. 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 You're okay? You guys are slaying me. Go oh. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Campbell. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. I'm throwing a vote in for you, Madam Clerk. Absolutely, <laughs> Mrs. O'Dell. Thank you. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Janey. Yes. Council Janey, yes. Council Mejia. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council O'Malley. Yes. And Council Wu. Yes. Yes. Madam President, docket number 0235 has been adopted unanimously. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. I want to just check in. I saw that Councilor Campbell uh, joined us. We just all signed on to this resolution. This is docket 0235. Would you like reconsideration to add your name, Councilor Campbell? Um, yes, and, and I know. Um, yeah, that yeah. Was and I'll just go ahead, Madam President. Go ahead. Did you want to speak? Yeah, I was dealing with this package issue. So thank you. I know I texted you and um, Madam Clerk and, and I know Madam Clerk was adding um, my name to the previous dockets, but I would be, uh, it would be a total mistake if I didn't say anything about um, uh, Pat O'Neill, who was not in my district, um, was outside of my district, of course, in district three. But when I ran for office, um, she welcomed me to her civic association, um, often called me her Irish daughter. Um, we mm -hmm. built an incredible relationship. She was near and dear. It was a shock to my entire team when she did pass. Um, I do share the same emotion that our clerk does. Um, she was a special woman and always put community first, but was really exemplary in demonstrating how you bring together folks around very uncomfortable and sometimes difficult conversations because she loved the city of Boston. And so I just wanna thank the makers for taking time to do this, for lifting her up. Um, and again, Madam President, thank you for allowing me just to chime in quickly, given what was happening on my end. I really appreciate it. But um, she will be missed. You know, of course, we send our, our, our love to her family, her friends, and that incredible community at Ashmont Adams. So thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you so much. She's yes. added her name, yes. Yes, and Madam President, um, does 
Councillor Campbell want to sign on to all the matters from 0 to 2 5 through you, this docket? Three. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, docket. Oh, I apologize. Was there a vote as well? Did I miss a vote? It was just yes. adding. They're all, yeah. It's, they're all votes. Yes. Well, no, to add your name. I'm sorry. No, there was a vote. So you missed a vote on a docket on Zero docket two 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 seven. Two seven. Uh, Madam Clerk, if it's okay, I'd like to go on record as voting in favor of that docket. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so Madam Clerk. 0235 has been adopted. Thanks. Many thanks to the makers. We'll move on now to docket 0236. Thank you. Sorry about that. Docket 0236, Councilor Sabi Dodge offered the following resolution recognizing annual homeless census. The chair recognizes Councilor Sabi George. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I, I do ask, it's not a suspension of the rules, but if we could add, uh, simply add Councilor Ed Flynn as an original co sponsor uh, to this resolution. Seeing and hearing no objections, Councillor Flynn is added. Thank you very much. Um, and I do ask that we suspend the rules and pass this resolution. Today is the, um, the regular day that we would do the homeless census here in the city of Boston. A number of us have participated in that year after year. It is a different year. It will not be held in the same way. We will not be present in the same way. But I do want to note uh, how important this day is uh, and how important this census is to those that remain unsheltered, unhoused, and, and experiencing homelessness in our city. Uh, this resolution will simply note the day um, as it is different than others. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I wanna say thank you to Councilor Sabi George for um, allowing me to be an original co-sponsor. I also wanna say thank you to Councilor Sabi George for her work on um, homeless issues relating to across the city. I'm proud to have many of them in my district, but the, the work of Councilor Sabi George on um, working with our homeless community is exceptional. Um, Madam, Madam President, I had the opportunity to, to attend the first um, homeless count in the early 80s under, under Mayor Flynn. I've attended many of them over the years under under Mayor Menino and, and, and Mayor Walsh as well. But there was a lot of, as Council Asabi George noted, there was always great, um, great volunteers that did it. Um, even, even some that are doing it today, including Jim Green. He's been around for uh, 40 years in the city doing tremendous work on, um, in the homeless community. But I remember doing the homeless count with Richie Ring from the Pine Street Inn. I remember doing it with Tip Kiernan um, as well, a, a leader in the homeless community, and with obviously with Mayor Walsh. And one of the things I think about when I hear Mayor Walsh is his commitment to homeless veterans. Um, the work the city of Boston has done, including Sheila Dillon, but the work Mayor Walsh has done on homeless veterans um, is probably the best across the country. And under the city of Boston, um, you know, we don't forget our homeless veterans. We provide as much opportunity and services for them. So I just want to say thank you to all of our dedicated city employees that really advocate for homeless veterans, for all, for all homeless people. Um, but again, want to say thank you to Councilor Sabi George for including me on this important resolution. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. A show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Braden, Councilor Edwards, Councilor Wu, Councilor Bach. Councilor Mejia, I think I have you already. Please also add the chair and Councilor Campbell. Uh, Councilor Bach, would you like to speak on this? Sorry, Madam um, President, I'm sorry. I just really wanted very briefly to, um, to say, I, I was thinking as we were raising our hands about the fact that uh, when we did this last year, um, I was uh, doing 
I was doing the count, the homeless census count in the public garden um, in my district. And uh, we found six people sleeping out that night. It was a cold night as folks may remember. Um, and so I just, I just wanted to add my voice to say, I think it's important in, in this council, this body to say that unhoused people are our constituents too. The folks who sleep in, in the public garden are constituents of district eight um, and, uh, and we've got, we've got folks in that position all over the city. So just, just wanted to add that word. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilors Asabi, George, and Flynn seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0236. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Docket 0236, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Sabi George. Yes. Councilor Sabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes, and Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0236 has been adopted unanimously. Wonderful. We'll move on to docket 0237. Thank you. Docket 0237, Councilors Asabi, George, and O'Malley offer the following resolution recognizing February 2nd, 2021 as World Wetlands Day. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Asabi George. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to thank, first thank Councilor O'Malley for joining me on this resolution, which rec recognizes February 2nd as World Wetlands Day. Wetlands are critical components of our ecosystem here in Boston, and many of our residents do great work to advocate on behalf of them. I want to thank the Longwood Area Neighborhood Association and the Mount Hope Canterbury Neighborhood Asso Association for helping our offices with this resolution. The 2019 Wetlands Ordinance was a critical step to protect wetlands across our city. Our residents continue to do so much good work across Boston to protect them, from Chandler Pond and Bright Brighton to Belle Isle Marsh in East Boston, to the Mattahunt Woods and Mattapan, to build climate resilient stormwater management systems through Codman Square's CDC certification program. I ask that we suspend the rules, pass this resolution, and continue to protect and celebrate our wetlands. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council Malley. Council Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Of course, uh, thank you to the uh, lead sponsor, Councilor Sabi George, for asking me to partner with her on this. And thank you also to City Councilor at Large Michelle Wu for her partnership in the Wetlands Ordinance, which we proudly passed as a body last year um, and was signed into law uh, in the very wetlands where I grew up uh, playing as a kid. So listen, there's no doubt that we need to underscore the importance that wetlands play in our city and every city uh, is one of the most unique and uh, uh, effective ecosystems there are. Wetlands provide flood protection. They provide uh, improving our water quality, erosion control, uh, opportunities for recreational space, just aesthetics, uh, just so many different ecosystems and, and animals that live in these wetlands. We need to protect them um, as an environmental social justice issue. It's important that we don't overdevelop them and put some safeguards in place so that we can actually grow them it means a huge obviously it is so impactful as we talk about development and what it means for cities particularly around flooding particularly around uh water management so this is something that's incredibly important uh i as much as i love groundhog day this year and every year i will be celebrating february 2nd as uh wetlands day uh and looking forward to uh, uh passing this or adopting this resolution uh, after we call for the suspension of the rules thank you madam president thank you Councilor Simon george Thank you so much. A show of physical hands, please, for those who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Edwards, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Bach, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Royo, Councilor Wu, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Mejia. Did I get everyone? Please also add the chair. Uh, Councilors Asabi George. 
and O'Malley seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0237. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Certainly. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0237 was adopted unanimously. Thank you so much. Docket 0237 has been adopted, so we will move on to docket 0238. Docket 0238, Councilor Edwards offers the following ordinance, extending and enhancing protections for tenants facing displacement by condominium co co cooperative um, exactions. No, I'm sorry, cooperative convergence, excuse me. So. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Edwards. Councilor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. We had an extensive conversation uh, last year about this. Um, and this is essentially the final product from these conversations. This, um, this proposed ordinance is originally came from the administration. And so I wanna give a lot of credit to um, Tim Davis, especially for his work. I also wanna thank Mac from Greater Boston Legal Services. Um, we had an extensive amount of um, hearings, but we just couldn't quite seal the perfect language on there and uh, ultimately needed to make sure that the proposed new system uh, that I will explain shortly uh, with ISD was okay with ISD. And so we wanted to check in with them. So just to give you what this does, it is updating the condo conversion ordinance that has existed for some time. And it adds in different categories of protected households. Those that are disabled, it takes the elderly age to 62. And I think it's originally at 65. And it also says low to moderate income um, classes of individuals, but it defines them at 80% AMI. And I think it was originally at 50% AMI. So we're increasing the amount of people who get the protections. Those protections include um, generally a one year uh, notification, uh, but they also get eligible households in those uh, groups get five years of an extended lease to stay and they have right of first refusal. Um, so, we wanted to make sure that that was also important. Other note, other other updates include um, vacant properties would get a one year waiting period of notice. And we wanted to also make sure that there was a form for that notice um, that comes to tenants that OHS, the Office of Housing Stability will create and specifically put out or specifically spell out the conversion process and tenants rights provided in multiple languages. We're very excited about that. There's also a limitation on those folks who have uh, uh, um, prolonged uh, leases. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> the new leases will be limited to no more than 10% of a rent increase or CPI, whichever is less. So that's very exciting that we're also making sure that the incomes or the rents are somewhat stabilized. We didn't want to, for example, protect people and then turn around and allow for their rents to double if they had a longer lease. Finally, um, another, other exciting things, the relocation benefit. Currently at $6,000, it would go to um, $10,000 for generally people. And then for the eligible tenants and the protected classes, it's currently $10,000, it would go to $15,000. And that's based on the fact that the rents honestly have, have so much increased that the average two bedroom apartments, first, last and security is $7,500. So there are other things that I can go through, including the, the, the entire process, the notification process and the new ISD permitting process, which is, I'll just quickly touch on that. In order to prevent the clear outs of business of, of buildings, which is what has been the biggest issue. People buy, clear out the building and then say, there's no, nobody to give their rights to. Instead, this time, in order to create a condo, you're gonna have to get a new permit and you're gonna notify the city 
of who was in the building before you got the, I'm sorry, Madam President. Oh, I'm good. I'm um, sorry, please continue. And you're gonna, you're gonna notify the city in order to get the permit, who was living there before, and that they were notified of all of their rights. This way, we are confirmed, no matter how you purchased your building, if you're going to create condos, you need this permit, and you need to have shown that you notified your tenants. That is very exciting. And that is what we needed to confirm with ISD. So the product is now pending before us. I will um, look forward to a, uh, a very quick uh, hearing because we had so many working sessions about it. And I just wanna thank um, all of the amazing people, uh, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Bach, especially who were at all of the working sessions and fighting for um, housing uh, for tenants' rights and making sure that we all were protected. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Um, is there any further discussion on docket 0238? Seeing and hearing no uh, other hands, would any councillors wish to add their name? Madam Clerk, please add Councillor Braden. Please add Councillor Campbell. Please add Councillor Bach. Please add Councillor Sivy George. Please add Councillor Arroyo. Please add Councillor Wu. Please add the chair's name. Please add Councillor Mejia. Please add Councillor Michael Flaherty. Please add Councillor Ed Flynn. And please uh, place docket 0238 in the Committee on Government Operations. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please read into the record and place before the body docket 0239. Docket 0239, Councillor Edwards offered the following order regarding a text amendment for Boston Zoning Code relative to affordable housing and jobs training exactions. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, the chair now recognizes the district council from East Boston. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I wanna say congratulations to this body as it was our linkage um, home rule petition that passed uh, just recently. And now we're seeing the result of our good work. We now have the autonomy to, to uh, change our linkage on our own here in the city of Boston and to have that conversation happen between the council and the, um, the BPDA and of course DND. That being said, I'm already starting to put this good work to work. And I have some very brief amendments that I think would make sense to help us assure some protections. The first one is basically putting in um, inclusionary development policy into the, um, into the zoning and also into this uh, ordinance to make sure that we are defining and clearly stating as a city that this is our policy. It is still exists as an executive order and we wanna make it permanent. The other thing that, we're, that this does, and I'm very excited, is it just kind of closes some, some, some loopholes and making sure that we're defining uh, the inclusion of development and substantially rehabilitated. Those were some definitions that I think we could tighten up. And then finally, um, or another thing is that we're, we're, excuse me, the amendments would also require that any time a developer, come back, developer comes back for an amendment on a PDA, even if they had an amendment and had this project before this was passed. If they come back for an amendment, we are requiring that they meet the current rate of the linkage. That way they don't benefit from rushing through that at any point in time, so they can get a favorable linkage. Essentially we're saying, if you go to change, we're gonna look at the CPI, we're gonna look at, excuse me, we're gonna look at the uh, current rate of the linkage and you, your new linkage will adjust up. Finally, what's really exciting is that we're gonna try and make sure we are adjusting up on an annual basis. Um, looking at the CPR combined index and on every July 1st that the BPDA would look at that and see if it's gone up, so shall our, so shall our linkage. So these things are actually not heavy lifts and they're purposely um, direct and I think very slight things to do because our current ordinance requires heavy study, economic analysis, and major um, back and forth between us and the um, major back and forth, uh, a deep, deep discourse between us and the BPDA if we were to, for example, actually change the linkage. So go from $9 to $20 or whatever is going to be proposed. I don't want these small things to be caught up in that back and forth when I think that actually they're text amendments, they're just putting in definitions and then just putting in the CPI hopefully will be a more streamlined um, passage. So very excited about this, excited to put our good work to work. This is the autonomy we fought for and I can't wait to have a good conversation about this. Thank you very much, Councillor Edwards. The chair now recognizes the district council from Beacon Hill, Councillor Bach, that you have the floor. 
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just, I, I wanna thank Councillor Edwards for her leadership on this and really all of the, um, I hope I won't insult anybody by saying legacy members of the council because the four of us who are new uh, didn't get to vote on this, um, but, uh, but the rest of you did send it up there. And I, I feel like we'd be remiss in this moment not to also thank our state colleagues for getting it done. Um, you know, I, I think there were a number of us on the city side up until three in the morning uh, the last night of legislature. And I know uh, State Senator Brownsberger, who I, um, who represents part of the same area as me, literally sort of snagged the physical packet and made sure it was going in the right place to get back over. And Senator Boncore, you know, uh, Senator Collins, I actually, this is a dangerous game because I'll start listing people and forgetting, but on the House side, you know, Chairman Michael Witz and, uh, uh, and Chairman Honan and, and Rep Livingstone and Nika, there's just a ton of people who, um, really helped this one get across the finish line. And then, and, and one of them was Mayor Walsh. And uh, I think it's worth saying that uh, two days before he uh, announced, uh, well, it was announced that he was nominated for labor. He was making calls on this. And, uh, and I know that our IGR, we in the council don't always see eye to eye with intergovernmental relations on everything. Um, but Caitlin's team really dogged this one and made sure also that it got not only not only through the two branches of the state legislature, but actually signed at the governor's desk. And unfortunately, a lot of things that should have been signed weren't. Um, and so I'm just really glad that when we got this that far, it actually got uh, got signed off on. And now as Councillor Edwards says, this is in our hands. Um, and I'm really grateful to the huge number of advocates and the IDP coalition who have pushed on this for so long. Um, and I think we're gonna need to have really robust conversations about how to improve both the IDP and the linkage policy. And I'm looking forward to that and excited about it. Um, but I also think that Councillor Edwards is right that there are some initial things in terms of actually codifying IDP and zoning because that was part of the whole point of this petition and, um, and, and making some kind of common sense tweaks to the linkage sort of systems in addition to the debate that we'll have over the rate. Um, I think that makes good sense. So just wanted to put a word in to say, really excited about this and very conscious of the huge number of people um, who worked on it. And if you're one of the state legislatures whose names I just forgot, uh, thank you to you as well. So thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Uh, any further discussion on docket 0239? Seeing and hearing none, would any councillors wish to add their name as a co-sponsor? Madam Clerk, please add the council president. Please add Councillor Flaherty. Please add Councillor uh, Braden. Please add Councillor Saibi George. Please add Councillor Flynn. Please add Councillor Arroyo. Please add Councillor Mejia. Please add Councillor Wu. Please add Councillor Campbell. Please add the chair's name. And docket 0239 shall be referred to the committee. Oh, please add Councillor Bach's name. Docket 0239 shall be referred to the committee on government operations. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Uh, so much for stepping in. I had to step away. Uh, before we move on, I'd love to get my name added to docket 0238, Madam Clerk. Thank you. And many thanks to Councillor O'Malley for stepping in. Um, at this time, we have finished with the section of motion orders and resolutions. So I want to bring us back to matters recently heard for possible action and call ask Madam Clerk, I know we read it into the record earlier, mm -hmm. but if you would mind reading docket 0155 into the record once again. My pleasure. Docket 0155, petition for a special law regarding an act relative to the office of mayor in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. Uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Edwards, who is the chair of uh, government ops. Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Just yesterday, we uh, held a robust conversation, almost four and a half hours, to discuss Councillor Arroyo's proposed um, home rule petition that would allow for us to amend the charter and uh, dispense with any um, special election if one might be needed this year. Um, if one, one would be needed this year only if um, our current mayor, Martin um, Marty Walsh, were to leave before March 5th. Um, the home rule is specifically introduced to make sure that regardless of when he leaves, that the election would go to the general, which would in general preliminary this fall. Um, at the hearing, we had many people come to testify and I wanna again, thank so many people in the community who came out and, and, and passionately described what it means to participate, why it's so important that we provide safe, 
um, transparent, clear means for them to participate and how we they felt that we would be more democratic if we dispensed with a special election and, and actually just went straight to the fall. Four elections, overwhelmingly, we heard that four elections in a matter of months makes very little fiscal sense and makes very little democratic sense. And it certainly doesn't make any practical or safe sense in a pandemic. I wanna just give a shout out to some of the folks who came to testify and the organizations. We had um, Michelle Carsonari from the Secretary of State. We had Anita Tavares, who commissioner from Boston Election Department. We had Sabina Pomonte as well um, from the Boston Election Department. We had Cheryl Crawford from Mass Vote, Carrie Costello from League of Women Voters, Beth Wong Mass Voters uh, from Mass Voter Table, and ben, Pam Cocksher from the Boston Municipal Research Bureau. Um, oh, excuse me, and Tanisha, Tanisha Sullivan from the NAACP, as well as Sam Gabru, who spoke from BECMA. It was again, a robust, beautiful panel discussing all different perspectives of enfranchisement and making sure that we have a safe election. I believe overwhelming amount of testimony came down on the side of wanting to be more democratic and safe and having a fall election. Uh, one person did uh, express concern about um, the rules. And I just wanted to, again, note to everyone, the rules can be changed and the process to change them is what Council Royo is doing. There is no work around. There is no bending of them. This is an open, transparent process and conversation that we are having. Um, so I, at this point, the conversation will continue. Uh, just, to, just to note, I wanted to note um, specific conversations about price points too that Sabina Bavante brought up. Um, he discussed the typical election cost being five to $700,000. That's without a pandemic. Um, so we were looking at, you know, increased costs, but also almost two to $3 million just to have a special election uh, because there's again, prelim and then the final. And honestly, I can think we did not hear from anybody noting that there was a better place, that there was not a better place in a pandemic to put that money at this time. Uh, moreover, just a, I threw out the question, honestly, have you ever seen something so crazy before? At which Sabina Pomonte politely reminded me, oh, there's been crazier apparently because in 2001, there were 10 special elections. And so kudos to the elections department for handling it. And I wanna be clear, uh, no one is doubting the ability for the elections department to handle this, okay? This is not a question of our amazing city staff being able to handle this moment. This is a question of whether we are more democratic as a city and if we are more safe as a city, if we were to have a special election. So the matter will stay in the, in the, in the government ops committee. We will have a working session on Friday at two o'clock. And as I stated publicly, there will be a vote next week on February 3rd. I think that's, um, that's, that's all. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Edwards for that committee report. Docket 0155 will remain in the Committee of Government Operations. We will now move on to personnel orders. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please read docket 0240. Thank you. Docket 0240, Councillor Janey for Councillor Bach. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0240. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Certainly. Councillor Arroyo on docket 0240. Yes. Councillor Bach, uh, Councillor Arroyo, yes. Councillor Bach. Uh, yes. Councillor Bach, yes. Councillor Braden. Yes. Councillor Braden, yes. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Edwards. Yes. Councillor Edwards, yes. Councillor Asabi George. Yes. Councillor Asabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Janey. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor yes. O'Malley. Yes. 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 <laughs> Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket 0240 passed unanimously. Thank you so much. Let's go on to docket 0241. Thank you. Docket 0241, Councilor Janey offered the following order. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0241. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Docket 0241, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. 
Councilor Arroyo, yes. Council Baker, Council Bach. Yes. Council Bach, yes. Council Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0241 has received, has passed unanimously. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next docket. Docket 0242, Councilor Janey offered the following order. Thank you. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0242. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Certainly. Docket 0242, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0242 has passed unanimously. Thank you so much. And docket 0243? Docket 0243. Councilor Janey offered the following order. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0243. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Docket 0243, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor yes. Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor yes. Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, oh, yes. yes, we can. Thank you. Councilor okay. Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 0243 has passed unanimously. Thank you so much. We will move on to late files. I am informed by our clerk that there are two late files. Yes? Yes, there are. Uh, before we move on, uh, Oh no, so I know what she's, Never mind. I see you, Councilor Wu. We'll, we're coming to you in a moment. Um, so these are late files that are being sent to our, our emails so that everyone has them. I want to make sure people have a moment to get those up. We need to take a vote to add them to our agenda before I'll ask the clerk to read them into the record. And I'm gonna ask uh, the clerk to do a roll call vote to add them to the agenda. Madam Clerk. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. 
Madam President, the two lay file matters are properly before the body. Thank you so much. We will uh, start with, there are two late file matters. We'll start with the first one, which is a letter from our colleague. Um, and the second one is an ordinance from Councilor Wu. Madam Clerk, please uh, read the, the letter. Thank you. January 27th, 2021. Dear President Daney, please be advised that I will not be in attendance at the Boston City Council meeting on Wednesday, January 27th, 2021. Please ask that the city clerk read this matter into the public record. Sincerely, Frank Baker, Boston City Councilor, District 3. Thank you so much. This first late file matter, which is a letter from our colleague, uh, will be placed on file. Madam Clerk, with the second late file matter, if you could please read that into the record. Thank you. Do you want me to read first and last or the whole? That would be fine. And Thank then I'm you. going to turn it over to Councilor Wu, who will talk about the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Offered by City Councilor Michelle Wu in the City of Boston City Council, an ordinance requiring equitable COVID-19 vaccine distribution in the City of Boston, whereas Black and Latinx residents of Boston suffered disproportionately from the coronavirus pandemic with the age adjustment date death rate for Black and Latinx residents of the Commonwealth three times higher than that of white residents. Whereas Boston is a city rich in healthcare resources with hospitals that have successfully begun the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine, employees, TO, TO employees and are planning expansion of vaccine efforts to their parties. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Boston, that the City of Boston Code Ordinance is hereby amended in Chapter 12 by adding the following sections. And be it therefore resolved that the Health and Human Service Cabinet is coordination in coordination with the Boston Public Health Commission shall issue publicly available weekly reports on numbers of citywide vaccination sites, including their locations, staffing and hours, and on the demographics of Boston residents receiving vaccinations, including their zip code, race, ethnicity, and gender. Filed on January 27th. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. The chair recognizes Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and I apologize for adding to our very long agenda to all of our colleagues. Um, among so many urgent issues before us today, COVID-19 makes each one worse and more dangerous. And we all know the direct way, the most immediate way to save lives is to end the pandemic by getting our residents the protection of the COVID-19 vaccine and to allow for a recovery to be possible. I'm sorry it had to come to filing an ordinance with basic provisions around equity and accessibility. But over the weekend, we learned just how stark the injustices of this pandemic are, even in this last step of getting our residents the life-saving vaccine. The rollout has been slow with hundreds of thousands of unused doses in Massachusetts. We are 29th in the country in getting this out to our residents. And to compound it all, Black and Latinx residents of Suffolk County, communities disproportionately bearing the burden of this pandemic in every way, are far less likely to live near a vaccination site than white residents. In Boston's hardest hit communities of Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, and East Boston, we have no vaccination sites at all. Now, the recent news that the state plans to open up a mass vaccination, public vaccination site at the Reggie Lewis Center is a good first step but the city must do more to ensure that all Boston residents have reliable and easy access to a vaccination site. So this ordinance, um, as you heard a little bit before, this ordinance would require the Health and Human Services Department to coordinate with the Boston Public Health Commission, private healthcare providers, and other city resources to ensure that we're bringing vaccines to every neighborhood. We need a vaccination site in every Boston zip code, and we need them to be available to residents at the times that fit families' lives, early mornings, evenings, weekends. The ordinance would also create a single online interface for appointment scheduling. We've all heard stories from relatives and loved ones and friends, whether it's to access a vaccine or to access testing, of feeling incredibly confused and spending precious time just tracking down how to 
where to go, how to make an appointment and, and worrying about how to get there. Boston residents shouldn't have to spend hours on the phone trying to track down life-saving information. The city must do more to build trust in the vaccination process, and that includes a scheduling process that is transparent and user-friendly. And finally, the ordinance would require the HHS cabinet to issue weekly publicly available reports on vaccination sites and their hours, as well as demographic information on Boston residents receiving the vaccine. Leaving this process up to chance would ensure that we will replicate the same inequities that have let, left Black and Latinx residents more vulnerable to this pandemic. We must be proactive in getting vaccines out to those communities that need them most. Um, so finally, I just want to emphasize that I hope this complements the discussion already started and that I'm very grateful for by our colleagues, Councillors Campbell and Arroyo on the hearing order to ensure that we are discussing every aspect of this. And so really hope that this dovetails with that conversation. Um, with even more variants of COVID-19 spreading now, the matter is incredibly urgent. And so we need to put some parameters and basic requirements to push the state to do the right thing and do it quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Councilor Wu. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and uh, thank you to the maker. I actually just have a quick question and uh, through you, the chair to the maker, maybe that's how it works. I don't know, but I'm just curious because I've been promoting this public um, hearing that Councillor Campbell had already put in the books back in December and we were gonna be talking about issues that uh, a lot of the folks out in the community have been talking about. So I'm just curious in terms of just kind of the process, like are, are we now moving straight into an ordinance when this was already filed? I'm just curious in terms of how that works and um, what role will the community play in informing this ordinance, if we're moving straight into an ordinance, I'm just curious in terms of like, how are we bypassing community voice in this process? And we, I know on my end, there have been a lot of community organizations that have been talking about this issue for a while. And so just curious about this process and how we're moving straight into an ordinance and how do we get here? If you could just provide some clarity for me, that would be great. Thank you so much for that, Councilor Mejia. With all of our dockets, if it's assigned to a committee, there will be a hearing and the public will have ample opportunity to weigh in. The same is true with this ordinance. So any docket that is before this body in a committee will have a public hearing or should have a public hearing. And so the same will be true for this ordinance. This ordinance is not something we're voting on today. We're just hearing about it today. And we're hearing about it in the late file because it didn't get to the clerk in time, but this will be assigned to a committee and there will be a hearing, okay? Does that clear? I guess what, I, what I'm, no, I'm, I'm sorry, Madam President, I'm a little bit slow. I'm just really curious about kind of then what's the difference between what was filed in December and this? Like what, what's the difference? It, it seems well, like the same conversation. Something was filed in December and was not voted on by the end of the year that docket doesn't exist anymore, remember? So everything that didn't get voted on and passed by the body, it doesn't exist anymore. So I'm not sure which docket you're referring to, but either we took action on it or it-, it It's a hearing that's slated for February the 9th, 20, 2021. That's what I've been promoting. If it's a docket before this body, we will have a hearing. So if there are gonna be two different hearings, there could be. So maybe there's a hearing in public health around that particular docket. This hearing, because it's an ordinance, would go into government ops and we will have a hearing in the government's ops. But in any case, the public will have ample opportunity to participate. Does that help clarify? Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Wu, did you want to add something to that? Or are you good? I'm, I'm happy just um, to expand a tiny bit more. I don't wanna take up too much time, but um, as I referenced in my earlier comments, this is really meant to complement the efforts and the conversations that are ongoing, but to provide some specific parameters and to move forward a piece of legislation that um, will give a little more urgency to, to the, what we're seeing happening from the state. I mean, the rollout process in general, I think deserves conversation on many, many aspects of it. My understanding, and of course, happy to, um, we'll look to participate in the hearing that um, that you have been promoting and that the, the uh, lead sponsors have been scheduling and preparing for. And I'm sure there will, that will encompass a whole range of topics in addition to the parameters around a vaccination site in every neighborhood and the other specific requirements of this ordinance. 
Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Royal. Councilor Royal. Thank you, you Madam, Madam President. Uh, I believe what Councilor Mejia is trying to refer to is Rule 15 and whether or not there's a Rule 15 violation, uh, a matter filed already. That's beyond my pay grade. I've just wanted to talk about specifically uh, if we're spending every uh, meeting talking about vaccines, I think that's the correct conversation to have, frankly. Um, we're in a situation right now where our communities are not receiving the vaccinations they need. There's multiple vaccinations. There's a lot of, uh, and I think that, so to be clear, there's a hearing scheduled for February 9th at 1 p.m. So if you're watching this, um, you should watch that hearing and you should attend uh, where we really need a lot of education for our community specifically about what the vaccine is, but also how to receive it. And I think what this ordinance is, is pushing at is that folks aren't able to receive it. They're just, it's not, it's not available in the way that it needs to be available, even if you know that you want it and you know that you need it. Um, and I think that's an important conversation for us to have. So I commend the maker for, for moving forward on this ordinance. I think it's a good thing for us to, to mandate, frankly, the data and the information that we need, whether or not it's a rule 15 or whatever. I didn't raise that. I don't know whether or not it is or isn't, but I think that's what Councilor Mejia was trying to, to get to. And I just wanted to help her with that. But in terms of the vaccine conversation, I think this is great. Uh, I would like to add my name to it, uh, depending on whether or not there's a ruling made on that, but I would like to add my name to this. I think that vaccines are an important conversation. I thank uh, Councillor Wu for bringing an ordinance to put some teeth into it. Thank you. If I may, Madam President. Yes, one being an order and one being an ordinance, please. Uh, yes, that, that's, that's the exact difference. The difference is one was an order for hearing and the other is an ordinance, uh, is for an ordinance. And so although they are the same topics, um, as you look back on many of the COVID-19 um, dockets that were filed, you know, it, each one seemed to have like a slightly different twist. So therefore we didn't eliminate them. We just added them to the discussion. But in this instance, because one is an ordinance and one was a call for hearing, uh, because we, you know, we did look at this very closely to make sure that rule 15 was not applying to this or was it applying, but it, it does not apply in this instance. And, and let me also just add, this is a good reminder for all of us to be extra careful about language. We could have a zillion hearings on COVID right. alone. There are so many issues that are before, that are a challenge in our city. Everything is at a, a breaking point. So we could have zillions of hearings on each of these issues. Really important, particularly as we're looking to refile certain things that we are being a little more strategic around, is this something that I could partner with someone else? They filed this last year, I filed this last year. Maybe we can combine it into one docket and not have a zillion hearings. I want to remind all of us mm -hmm. that these hearings uh, remotely have gone on extra long. We're not in the chamber. We have um, several members who serve on panels. We have a lot of interest in terms of public who testifies. And what has been the exception is now the rule. And that is a heavy, heavy burden, particularly for central staff. So I do want to encourage folks this is the beginning of the year. I know a lot of people are doing their refiles. Please take a look, see if there's an opportunity to partner, if it's similar to another hearing that was already done. We don't need to have two, three, four dockets all talking about the same thing. So please just be mindful of that. And remember that every time we have a four, five, six hour hearing, that that is a great burden on everyone who is behind us, not just your individual staff teams, but central staff as well. So thank you, thank you for that question, uh, Council Mejia. I hope that clarifies things for you. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Just want to expand on that. I concur with my colleague on, on the Rule 15 issue. And I think it's important, particularly for the newer members, uh, just to continue to refresh uh, themselves with the council rules. But in particular, that particular uh, uh, rule pertains to matters filed in the same calendar year I think through the chair, I think council media referenced something being filed in December of uh, 2020, um, that therein lies the distinction. In addition to all colleagues, um, a matter that's sort of similar in substance and nature uh, cannot be admitted sort of under the guise of, I guess, um, 
of an amendment, if you will. So if it's similar in substance in general, uh, it's best to uh, defer to the original lead sponsor and work together uh, on whether it's the hearing or not. So I just, I concur on that because we can continue to get down the road um, and make sure that uh, I think that uh, rule 15 needs to be strictly enforced and the onus is on us as members, but also it may, through the chair, may consider an omnibus a COVID um, committee uh, to be able to sort of uh, be the clearinghouse for all things COVID, uh, just in light of uh, all of the twists and turns, as the clerk had indicated, uh, through uh, the guise of an amendment and or un under the uh, auspice of, uh, of COVID, uh, lots of things are going to start to sort of uh, uh, cross, I guess, if you will. And so just to be cleaner and neater uh, from a legislative standpoint and adhering to Rule 15, the calendar is important, but also uh, making sure that uh, similar substances uh, stay on their own parallel uh, track. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just say as the chair of public health, I think we've done a pretty good job making sure that when we're having COVID conversations that we're making sure that they're, they're timely, they're on specific subjects and we're not having multiple subjects with slight outliers. Um, and so I think we, we've done pretty well at that. Uh, and again, I just want to commend the maker for, for tackling a very important issue uh, for the city. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Campbell. Councilor Campbell, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I wasn't really originally going to speak because I wanted to be careful that things didn't get political when we're dealing with folks uh, with respect to COVID vaccines and people dying. Um, I will just lift up, you know, there is a toll it takes on central staff to hold a whole host of hearings with respect to the same topic. There's a toll it takes on our team. Then of course, there's a toll it takes on those who are participating in the hearings residents, of course, that we ask to come and participate, as well as those who are the experts, right, who are going to show up on a particular hearing. Um, in this particular case, I do recognize that this is an ordinance that will go to government operations. Um, we filed a hearing order, and, you know, I filed a hearing on in December, we filed it this year, covering the same exact, exact topics. Didn't include specifics just yet, because we thought it was extremely important to have conversation with residents first, folks on the ground, but also to have a conversation with our health commission officials and others, not just about location, of course, of where we place um, sites for folks to get vaccinated. Yes, we are not doing an excellent job. We have been sounding the alarm, I along with my team since the very beginning. It's been just beyond troubling. We're still uh, behind when it comes to testing as well. Sites, the delays and response, you name it, more work to do. Um, but the goal of the initial hearing was also to say we need a multilingual, culturally competent strategy. There are organizations who are lining up to fund this, to fund organizations on the ground, not specifically community health centers and others, to make their spaces, of course, available for uh, delivering uh, vaccinations. Um, but also this, you know, data and interface, all of that. But it was a bit broader, but I did think it warranted a conversation with our health commission and team first and city employees. I will tell you one thing I do wanna add, if it's uh, maybe this is through the chair of public health and the chair of government operations to bring the hearing orders together in some way, I don't know, but I do think it would be a total mistake to try to hold two hearings on the same topic um, when one seems to be a subset of the other. Just my thoughts as a, the original lead sponsor on it um, as folks lift up uh, rule 15. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? At this time, a show of hands for those who would like to add their name to this late file matter, which is an ordinance. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Edwards, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Bob, Councillor Braden. Councillor Mejia, I have you. I have Maybe a question. The screen is frozen. Uh, Councillor, no, we're not at discussion right now. Councillor Flynn. Madam President, could you please add my name? I'm unable to raise my hand. I see. Okay, please also add that was Councilor Asabi George. Did I have everyone who wants to be added? Please also add the chair. This particular late file matter, which is an ordinance sponsored by Councilor Wu, will be referred to the Committee of Government Operations. Um, the chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have a, a floor. So I'm just curious, are, when, you, when this goes to government ops, are we gonna do 
both hearings or is that something that's still to be determined? Government ops. How we're going to function? Yes, government ops will have the hearing on this because this is an ordinance. So this will definitely go to the government ops. Uh, I so not still one. Yes, I'm not one for joint hearings of, of two committees coming together. It's not an easy thing to undertake, particularly for again the people behind the scenes who are doing the work to make us out front look good. It is very difficult to do these joint hearings. So I would certainly encourage these, these are, this is the issue right before us. So I would certainly encourage that these hearings um, that you do coordinate, maybe there's an opportunity to have the first hour be the public health committee talking mm -hmm. about the hearing order. And then maybe the second hour can be the GovOps. I would encourage that coordination, but they will be two separate hearings on the matter two separate committees. Is that helpful? Excellent. Wonderful. Yes, thank you very much, Madam President. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So why don't we move on? Nothing to worry about in the green sheets just yet. <laughs> wonderful. Um, and so we'll move on to the consent agenda. At this time, the chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? On the consent agenda, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Councilor Campbell. Larry. Yes. Yeah. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Yes. Councilor Edwards, yes. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council yes. Janey. Yes. Yes. Council Mejia. Yes. Council Mejia, yes. Council O'Malley. Yes. Council O'Malley, yes. And Council Wu. Yes. Council Wu, yes. Madam President, the consent agenda has been unanimously approved. Thank you so much. We will move on now to announcements. A show of blue Zoom hands if you have an announcement. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, this announcement is uh, a sad one. Uh, it's on behalf of uh, Elias Akiki, uh, who does business in my neighborhood, was the High Park uh, Business of the Year. His, his uncle, uh, who was part of starting that company in the 70s with his parents, uh, passed away uh, and we weren't able to get his name in time to be closed in memory of him. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that I spoke a little bit about Mitchell Ruhana and his impact in helping to start as a Lebanese family who came here as immigrants to make something of themselves. Uh, they are one of the businesses that I depend on, frankly, uh, as community neighbors. Just this this winter, they were driving Santa Claus around on the back of a tow truck flat bread. Uh, and so they are the kind of folks that really, really, really came to America, wanted to make America home, but also wanted to make it better than they found it. Uh, and he was one of the folks who really did the work to do that. And so uh, it's a great loss uh, for him, uh, Elias Akiki, but also for his mother, because that is her brother. Uh, so I would like if we could close as well in memory of Mitchell Ruhana. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, um, I will be very brief, but I just wanted to um, acknowledge and remember that today is um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, on, this, on this day, we remember in honor the six million Jews and millions of others that were killed by the Nazis during the Holocaust. And we honor those who survived. Um, we reaffirm our commitment to the dignity and respect of all people. Um, everyone should be able to celebrate their religion, their heritage, their culture without fear of violence, bigotry, persecution. We must continue to confront and combat the rising tide of anti-Semitism um, and continue to support our Jewish neighbors by standing up in solidarity with them. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you, um, Madam President, for giving me this opportunity to talk about this important day. Thank you so much. Thank you. The chair 
No other announcements? Yes. Uh, Councillor Sabi George. The chair recognizes Councillor Sabi George. Thank you again, Madam President. Sorry for not having my camera on. I would like to take this moment just to congratulate uh, my Chief of Staff, Jessica Rodriguez. Her grandmother, Ms. Rodriguez Hovell, made, uh, became a US citizen officially earlier this week and just would like to wish her congratulations and um, a moment of sort of celebration for, uh, for that. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Not seeing any other announcements, anyone else? Well, let me just take a, a brief moment to uh, just recognize um, my team. Uh, in particular, I want to shout out Michaela Parkin, who is, well, was my policy director, uh, and she has been promoted to deputy chief of staff. So I just wanted to give her a public shout out. Very proud of her and the work that she has been doing uh, for my team. And so just wanted to give her that, that public acknowledgement. So, and many of you have had the chance to work with Michaela as my policy director, certainly our clerk and our, our folks behind the scenes as we prep for these meetings. So congratulations, Michaela. Um, as we always do, we will close out this meeting in memory of those we have lost. We continue to lift up all of those who have lost their lives due to COVID-19 and to keep them in prayer, more important to continue our strong advocacy uh, for them. Today, uh, we will adjourn in memory of the following individuals for Councillor Arroyo, Mitchell Ruhana, for Councillor Bach, George Clusios, for Councillor Baker, Lance Norwood Jr., for Councillors Baker and Asabi George, Madeline M. Carney, for Councillor Campbell, Veronica Weathers Elam, for Councillor Edwards, Thomas Edward Byrne, for Councillor Asabi George, Thomas Pete Parker, for the chair, Henry Tapia, and for the entire Boston City Council, Hank Aaron, a moment of silence. Thank you. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. We are scheduled to meet again remotely on Wednesday, February 3rd at 12 noon. Again, this meeting will be held remotely. And this council meeting today is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So that was a hard knock. Kim. <laughs>